see no reason why we can't start. Um, thank you very much for coming along to the October meeting of the Planning Committee. Uh, I'll go through a couple of items first of all, and then I've got a few updates. Uh, one, apologies. I have an apology from Councillor McGrath. He's somewhere else. I know that Councillor Thompson is attending a funeral, and he may or may not be able to make the meeting. So uh, we'll keep a note of that. And Councillor Mahan, Councillor David Mahan, is going to be joining by uh, WebEx, and he hasn't joined as yet, but he... Yeah, well, that's okay. I know he has to declare an interest in the first item on 4-1, so he might just wait till after that. That's okay. Right, second is to sign the minutes of the Special Planning Committee meeting held on the 11th of September. I've already done that and handed that over. And have we any declarations of interest apart from Councillor Machen, I think, on item 4-1? Uh, I've got Councillor McCann. Councillor McCann, Stephen? Thank you, Chair. It's application number 6, LA 10, 2022, 0, 1062. Oh, I was okay, in favour of that application yep. in a previous uh, meeting. In a previous life, well done. Yep. Yep. Any other declarations of interest? No, I don't see that. Two items for update, and then I'll hand over to Darren very quickly and something. Uh, there was mention or there was talk about members not quite being able to see the detail on the screen with regard to some of the images, of whether that's flat plans or photographs. I know Darren is working with IT to try and see if we can get a resolution to that going forward. Um, Aaron's going to deal, deal with a few other issues, but before I hand over to him, the meeting of the LDP group next week, because there are some items to deal with, but not, not a huge amount of um, matters on the agenda, it's decided that it will be held as a virtual meeting. So um, joining instructions will be sent out. I will be in the chamber along with Paul and Louise, but um, and that will be in Inniskillen. So members can come to Inniskillen if they want, if they're around there, or just join virtually on WebEx. Okay. Now I'll hand over to Darren before we go into the substantive item number four. Here's an update on a few matters to bring forward. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, just to follow on from the meeting last month, uh, and before I go into the, the current applications on the agenda to give you an update, uh, one of the applications last month, LA 10 uh, was an outline application of the direction of a dwelling for Mr. McDermott. It was deferred at the committee meeting in September for one month to allow the applicant to or, and the agent to, to yeah, get speaking rights. Um, however, additional information was received from the applicant and published on the planning portal on the 10th of October. Um, Neighbours and third parties have been re-notified of that information, so the application cannot be included in this month's agenda, but it will be returned next month. So it's just to give you an update on that one. In relation to two items on the agenda today, the application number three, paper B, application number three, LA 10 2023 1502, and application number four, LA 10 2023 1500, two outline applications for dwelling houses on the Co Road by Mr. McHugh. Um, the first one was uh, deferred at the committee last month for one month to allow the applicant to uh, ask for speaking rights. Application number four uh, is being presented to the committee for the first time, having been called in from the weekly list. Um, there's a request has been received from the agent for a deferral of the both applications. Uh, that request was received on the 13th of October, uh, members. And on the screen then you can see the the reason for the request. Now, uh, I'll just try this, members, just as a, as a test to see... Uh, So hopefully the screen now has been, there's an option now to zoom in and out members. So I'll just use this as an example so I can zoom in now on the screen. So if there's something on the screen that you see and you'd like me to zoom in on, if you ask me to do that, I can now be advised and told how to do this. So I can zoom in and out and hopefully that'll assist everybody today. So it's an example just of what we can do here to try and improve things. So the reason for the request is I know it's very much against protocol and procedure to seek a second deferral but I had a previously arranged family gathering and will actually be travelling back on the 18th. I fully understand your commitment to have both, to have applications determined as soon as possible and would not wish to abuse the system, but if you can accommodate me in the matter, I'd be extremely grateful. And that's from the agent, as I say, received requesting a deferral for, for both applications. 
The first one has already been deferred once. The second application is being presented for the first time. And, and just to make known, the agent is Morris Kane from Inniskillen. Just for your information and benefit. Members, it's up to you what you want to decide. We've deferred one of them last month, and this is a, another one brought in. The issue is that they're nearly co-located um, on, the, on the same road and basically in a line. And it's probably from um, a work point of view, you really want to talk about the two of them. Uh, they're separate, but you need to sort of talk about the two of them at the same time. So it's up to you what you want to do. Uh, Councillor Riley Tom, you got in first of all, Stephen, I'll let you in afterwards. Chair, in light of the request and in light of the circumstances, I'm happy enough to uh, propose on this occasion uh, that we defer them and uh, bring them back in next month. It's okay, thank you. And Councillor McCann, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second that. I suppose it's not. We don't live in an ideal world, and I suppose things can happen. People's busy. It's not ideal for the committee to have deferrals, but you know, uh, in the best interest of the applicant. And the we have talked about process. this, and this is one of the items we want to close the loop off, but we haven't got to the stage where yeah. we close the loop off. So we're still. I would support the yeah, proposal. That's it. Okay. Look, I've got a proposal to defer the two to obviously give the opportunity to the agent to um, come together and talk on both. Are we all happy? Right, that's uh, unanimously agreed that we run with that and those two items are now deferred yeah. until whatever. So just to confirm for those listening in, uh, items number three and four and paper B have been deferred uh, for one month and will be represented at the next planning committee meeting in November. Right, thank you. No further updates, so we can get back to the agenda properly. And that is, uh, we're on to item four now. And there are two applications. Yep. First one, LA10 bar 2021 bar 0681. And that's uh, McDonald's restaurants in, in the skill. I'll hand over to Darren. Okay, so application number one, paper A, LA10 2021 0681A. It's a freestanding totem sign at the look, uh, McDonald's, new McDonald's restaurant in Enniskill, uh, which is on the, the site of the former TP Topping Car dealership uh, on the Dublin Road in Enniskill. The recommendation, members, is to approve advertising consent for the reasons listed within the report. Just take you through some of the details then, members. So the, the application is for a sign uh, at the previously approved McDonald's, which was granted under LA10 2021 uh, which granted permission to replace the TP topping building with the new restaurant. Uh, the sign then is an eight metre high totem sign and a low prominent landscape from the views approaching and exiting the town. The sign will not detract from the character and amenity of the area and will not prejudice road safety. It's near to a number of listed buildings and other features of interest, for example, Coles Monument, uh, but will not affect the setting of these assets. Consultees are all content with DFI Roads Content and Department for Communities Historic Environment Division also content. So the on the screen before you remember, says that's the layout for the McDonald's restaurant that has been granted approval previously. The sign then will appear up at the roadside within the, the small yellow circle, or red circle, sorry, up at the, the road. And the next plan then, as I said, just shows the entrance details coming into the site with the totem pole then just at the side of the entrance as you come in. The advertisement then is an eight meter high single column pole with the three advertisements at the top. It's internally illuminated and has a typical McDonald's branding on it. The location then, the applicant has provided a photo montage of what the sign will look like. And you can see on the screen then the location of the sign then in relation to roughly the position that it'll be on the on the site when the building is redeveloped and the new McDonald's restaurant is erected. Uh, you can see the Coles Monument in the background. And uh, that was an important material consideration not to block the views or affect the setting of the monument. Um, Department of Communities are content that it will not harm the setting. Uh, and planning officers would agree with that. There's other listed buildings in the area, um, which are also nearby, and again, their setting will not be affected. So overall, the recommendation then is to approve advertising consent for the reasons listed within the report. Thank you, Ross Sharon. Any questions for Darren in regard to the uh, details of the application? 
If we don't have any questions for Darren, I'm looking for a recommendation. Uh, Councillor, hold on, we'll get to you. Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, happy to propose the recommendation. Thank you very much, Tommy. Councillor Robinson, Paul. Happy enough to second it. Great. Any further recommendations? No. It's been proposed and seconded uh, to go with the officer's recommendation to approve. All agreed? All agreed. That's unanimous. Darren. Okay, so uh, application number one, LA 10 2021 slash A. Uh, the recommendation of officers was to approve advertising consent. Members have granted advertising consent for the same. Move on to application number two, LA 10, bar 2023, bar 21, bar 66. And it's uh, FODC application. So members, the second application in paper A then, uh, LA 10, 2023, 2166A, again, advertising consent is being sought by the council in this case for two stone entrance features uh, into the village. And the location then is on the grass verge between the Belfast Road uh, and the uh, main road to Lisbalaw and at the other end of the village um, as well near to the Belfast Road. The recommendation is to approve advertising consent for the reasons listed within the report. I'll just take you through the details again, members. So the signs then are located at either end of the village. So there's two. The first one's on the Belfast Road. The second one then, members, is at the other end of the village um, on that road, which I'm not going to pronounce. I'm sure you, you can pronounce it for me. Thank you. Um, so it's on the other end of the village. The first one is it's in between the Belfast Road and the Enniskillen Road, the Grass Verge. So the first sign's going to be located there. Um, and the other sign then is at the other end of the village, just again on the, the verge beside the, the road as you approach into the, the village. The sign itself is uh, stone uh, um, with the letters on the front of it. You can see, welcome to Lisbalaw, the hard rocks. Uh, the sign itself, the stone will be two metres wide and about a one metre tall. And it'll sit on a plinth, so overall it'll be three metres wide by one and a half metres uh, in height. With the... Um, ground around it being, being uh, raised to accommodate the, the plinth and the, the new advertisement. And that's an aerial view looking down on top of it. So you can see the width of the stone there, location around it. Planting will be put around the sign, uh, which will soften the appearance of it. And finally, then a cross section then through the ground. So the existing ground level is red. And you can see the... Um, Got their speaker on. Okay. Okay, so on the screen then is the cross section. So much Councillor Campbell. And uh, you can see the existing ground level then in red, and there'll be a, a raised plinth then, which the the advertisement will sit into the stone itself then will be sourced by the local community group and cut the dimensions uh, and carved as appropriate. So the recommendation then is to approve advertising consent for the proposed sign. Um, the sign is appropriate to the location. All consultees or consent DFI roads have replied stating they have no objections. They have requested a condition that the sign is located uh, as positioned on the drawings with a minimum two metre clearance to the public road edge. And the reason for this is in the interest of road safety and convenience of road users. However, the condition is not necessary as the plans show the position of the signs. And if they're not built in accordance with the approved plans, then they will not benefit from the advertisement consent. So there's no need to do that. However, an informative can be included on the decision notice advising the developer that the siting and placement of the sign must be in accordance with the location on the approved plans. Thank you very much, Darren. Any questions for Darren? Uh, I have one comment to make because uh, I live in the village. Uh, I noticed that preparatory work has already taken place in regard to the foundations. Um, I'm not sure whether that is correct, and I would basically bounce back through our officers that until actual planning permission has been granted, no preliminary work should have taken place. So could... Um, metaphorical slap of somebody's wrist basically please uh, in that regard because there was a presumption that it would get planning permission if the work was carried out so um, somebody jumped the gun uh, i don't want that to happen again 
Um, Councillor Maguire, I think, tell me. I go, go to Kerry, uh, on the back of what the chair has just said, I'd be inclined to maybe oppose this, but <laughs> 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 I, I do jest. Uh, no, if I could just have one question there, the, the, the writing on the stone, the hard rocks, and possibly a question to the chair himself, you may understand what's the significance of the hard rocks in relation to Liz Law. The hard rocks basically is not the list below in sort of uh, medieval terms. It's always been known as the hard rocks because there is um, a large um, area of granite rock around the Church of Ireland. And throughout, uh, there's a seam throughout the whole of the village. And it's, I think, from a couple of centuries ago, it's um, been known basically as the hard rocks. I don't think there's a townland equivalent, but it's always been known as the Hard Rocks. And, uh, obviously, as the chair would be aware, I, I possibly would have preferred a translation of Liz Bale and Aha, which means the wood at the mouth of the ford, which might have had more uh, historical significance to myself. But uh, notwithstanding, not happy enough to propose the recommendation. Thank you very much, Tony. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Robinson? Happy enough to second. Okay, thank you. Any further proposals? If not, I've got a proposal duly to propose a second to go with the officer's recommendation to approve. All agreed? All agreed. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. We'll now move on to um, item five, and we have six items for discussion here, two of which you will note we have deferred already. Uh, we're going to the first one, so that's 5 1 LA 10 bar 2022. Bar 0496, and we have speaking rights on this. Uh, Darren? Okay, members, so paper B, then application number one, LA10 2022 0496 slash O, is for the erection of one replacement dwelling house with the retention of the original structure as an ancillary art building. The applicant is G. Rooney, and the location then is 273 metres southeast of 91 Bow Island Road, Commons and Bleak. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report, which includes four reasons for refusal. Uh, members will note from the report the application was recommended for refusal and was called in and was presented to the meeting in September where the application was deferred by members to afford the agent the opportunity to speak seek speaking rights and make representations. So the application is now presented for a uh, decision. So on screen members and as in members, if there is a slide that you wish me to zoom into, um, you know, please point that out to me and I'll, I'll try and make that work today. Um, so on the, on the left of the slide is the site location plan. You can see the the main road in Bleak is at the top with the access then coming in and down the green line uh, down towards the application site itself, which is set back in off the road and down at the yellow star. On the right-hand side of the slide then, I've zoomed in on the actual site location plan and you can see it's a rectangular shaped plot. Uh, there's an annotation or an outline of a, a proposed dwelling on it and it's adjacent to the dwelling to be replaced. So I'll just try and see if I can this work, members, for the first time. So hopefully that assists. So you can see the the location of the dwelling then, the proposed dwelling and the building then is to, the existing building then is to the side of it with the red line then around the application site itself. So in terms then of the uh, few slides members from Street View, just to show the location. I'm sure you know the entrance into Bleak well. If you come in, there's a row of houses. Then there's a, an access down in serving those properties. And that's the access then down into the application site, which is then further across the fields. At the end of the, the application site was that old building, and that's a, a photo of it from the agent supporting photographs. So on the left is the an image of the building to be replaced on the outside, and you can see the condition of the building there. On the right hand side then is a, a photograph again supplied by the agent to the inside of the building. Three of the walls are tin uh, and then the rear wall uh, is made of stone and you can see then the gap in that wall. Again just some more supporting information provided by the applicant in support of the application. So on the left hand side you can see the slide then uh, it says location of dwelling to be replaced, no tree cover which was cut away in December 2021. 
and the slide on the right then, figure two, again shows the front uh, elevation of the building with the opening into it. And it states vegetation and roof would have been rendered structured undetectable from an aerial photo. And then again, it says heavier trees on the ditch were also cut, but would have grown over the structure in the 2020 aerial photograph. Photo clearance took place in the December 2021. So just to run through some of the, the planning department's evidence members, you'll note from the report that um, planners are of the view that the building to replace does not exhibit the essential characteristics of a dwelling. And essentially that's the question before you today, members, is a, a query from the planning department of whether this was a dwelling house, um, but not only that, whether it exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. So these images before you, members, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the Ordnance Survey maps from 1834. And again, at the top, you'll see this is the first edition county series, sheet 8, 1834. And then there's a, a, a snip of the actual drawing. Again, I'll just zoom in and move it across to let members see. So you can see, I just catch yourself up here. It's just, uh, if I zoom in now. So members, you can see on that Ordnance Survey map that beside the arrow, that's the location of our site where that uh, the application has been applied for. And on that, you can see the rectangular outline of a, a, a L-shaped building. It looks from the details that there's actually two buildings. There's a rectangular one at the front and then another rectangular one at the back, 90 degrees to it. So that's the 1834. Again, then moving across then the 1856. On the right-hand side of the slide, again, similar um, map, historic map ordinance survey, and I provided at 1854. And you can see over on the right-hand side, again, there is the image of a building. <laughs> on this site, I'll just zoom in again. So you can see the rectangular outline of a building. And then there's a rectangular shape of an a building at the rear. You know, moving on then to the next series of Ordnance Survey maps, which are available in 1905. On the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the uh, Sheet 8, 1905 survey date. And again, the Ordnance Survey have identified that there is a building on this site. You can see the outline then of the field hedges that would have existed in 1905 together with the uh, many buildings that would have been on that site at that time have been identified in their, in their historic maps. So we're then moving forward then on to the next series of ordnance survey maps that uh, the planning department has available to itself and that's 1952 to 1969. And these maps then show the new buildings in the area uh, that have appeared, they also map the field boundaries. And I've identified in the yellow circle members, you can see then that there's nothing showing on our site that has been applied for currently. Uh, you can see the outline of the field boundaries remains from the previous maps. However, uh, as I say, there's no building identified on that field. Next uh, evidence that the planning department has is an aerial flyover map dated 2004. Again, this shows the location of the site and you can see from that now that the field hedges are well developed and that is accepted. Um, but uh, there's no evidence of any building on that site again in 2004. And then on the next one again, there's uh, the field hedges have actually been removed and the cartilage of the dwelling um, has been removed from the field. And there's no evidence again of any building on the site. So remember, all of that background information is important uh, in relation to the application that's before you today. It's an application under HUU 08 as a rural replacement dwelling. And just to uh, go through the four criteria. So the council will support the replacement of an existing dwelling. So it has to be existing. It's not a dwelling that was on the site but is no longer there. The dwelling has to be existing. Where all the following criteria are met. And you have four criteria A, B, C and D. So A is that the dwelling to be replaced exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling and as a minimum all external structural walls are intact and B then it's within the cartilage surrounding the original dwelling.
exceptionally on alternative location in a position nearby may be acceptable where there is demonstrable benefit in doing so. And it's those two issues that are really uh, key today in the consideration of this application. DEO 3 is also material. Um, sustaining rural communities requires all development proposals for buildings in the countryside must cluster, consolidate and group new development with existing established buildings. And that's plural, remember? So buildings, there must be more than one. In this case, we only have the one building on the site. Um, so there is not a, a group of established existing buildings. So to say, just remind members say when you look at the supporting photograph from the agent, and I'm sure they'll go through this themselves in, the, in the, her speaking rights, the building to replace is on the left. The reason for fusel or summarize is saying it doesn't cluster, consolidate and group with established buildings. The building to replace is not except the essential characteristics of a dwelling, and it's not located within the curtilage surrounding the dwelling, the original dwelling. So the reasons listed within the report in line with the wording of the transitional arrangements in the 2015 LDP regulations, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the local development plan for the reasons stated, and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved contrary to the local development plan. It's recommended for refusal. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, sorry, Darren. Uh, we now have um, speaking rights from the agent, Martin McLaughlin. Martin, could you dress over to one of the... Yep, that'll do. You up to 10 minutes, Martin. I'll put you live um, to deliver um, what you want to deliver to the committee. Thereafter, the committee members may or may not ask you questions in regard to what you said or further detail about that. If not, then I'll ask you to withdraw and go back to your seat. And then I'll ask uh, Councillor Feely, John, to come up and make his presentation. So are you are ready to go? Right, I'll just make you live. Hold on here. Yep, away you go. You. Ten minutes. Uh, well, firstly, the applicant has asked me to thank you, the Planning Committee and Council staff, for allowing us the opportunity to present our case today. I had actually brought photos which are pretty much all on file, but uh, they would actually highlight our case much better. There's about 15 of them here, if we could distribute them. No, it, unless you've actually submitted the evidence previously to our officers have just got clarity there. Okay. You can't present it, so it's an oral representation with regard to your case. Okay, you, you may hear me refer to one or two of the photographs in this, but um, if I could ask Darren maybe to throw up the, the last slide that he had. Yeah, you've got one of the internal of the building. Just there. Okay, so in the photographs here, we would have had slightly better and clearer um, photos of the inside of the building. Um, so if uh, our, our main case is that the, the building internally, especially, uh, do, does exhibit the characteristics of a dwelling. Uh, I know Darren referred to uh, two metal walls, three metal walls and a stone wall. However, the, uh, the indentation on the wall there is actually a fireplace. And we can see there's a cast iron fireplace that's actually lying on the floor. Um, also internally, we have a, a PVC door that was originally used for the dwelling and we have a timber window. Um, now, on top of this, we can see just to the, if you look to the back of the fireplace, Darren, if you could zoom in. Okay, so if you see just above the fireplace and to the left, that is actually a timber sheeting. And in on the metal wall to the left, I have photographs that would have showed it more clearly, there is tongued and groove sheeting as well. And on the ceiling, there is, uh, there's like an old type of beauty board that actually has been done out in squares. Um, now, it's very much when you see it. You definitely get the appreciation that, that somebody did live here at some stage and that they would have had a bit of pride in where they lived. Um, it, it's typically, it's like an old type version of what we would do with dry lining for a building. Um, and if you put that together with the fireplace and the oral history that we're about to expand for you as well, um, I think that certainly on our side of the desk, there's there's no doubts that there was a dwelling there. Um, so... On the on the left hand side of that slide, then Darren, 
Okay, so that's the reason why we are here today, because obviously we fully accepted since the application went in, this is not a normal case. However, we have to take into account the characteristics of the man who occupied the dwelling, as well as the characteristics of the dwelling itself. Uh, we had attached in the application, which wasn't referenced here today, uh, a few letters from local residents. One of those local residents was Joe Lachlan, who, if you're familiar with um, Fermanagh Historical Society's Joe's a fountain of knowledge on everything, but Joe did actually know the old man who lived in this house. Uh, and in Joe's letter, Joe sets out, um, in the mid-1950s, Leo Gallagher, who was the resident of the dwelling, was renovating the dwelling. Um, Joe helped him out. He provided a few bits for him. Now, the, the dwelling was actually been renovated in the mid-1950s, so obviously it was there much longer. Um, we had also uh, furnished an application from the local undertaker, Patsy McCauley. Now, apart from attending to the, the man's tragic demise, uh, Patsy also um, outlined how he was a regular visitor uh, to what was Leo's unique little house on the edge of the village of Bleak. Uh, it would appear that many residents of Balik would have killed with Leo in his home, and he apparently was an entertaining character, albeit vulnerable, as we would describe it today, which would be in keeping with the isolated lifestyle that he led up until his death in the 1970s. Uh, Councillor Feeney is going to speak shortly in support of the case. I believe that the first thing that you'll see from Councillor Feeley's uh, testament will be how easy it is to find people of a certain age in Balik who will remember Leo Gallagher, and who will know where his house was. But unfortunately, that history is disappearing very fast. And uh, I, I think we have an opportunity here today to remedy that, and maybe just to rescue a little bit of social history. Um, we did have, as part of our um, presentation, we actually had Joe's letter, and we had a photograph that showed the resident. Leo Goller was the man on the right. Um, now, unfortunately, as I said, Leo seems to have been a, a, a kind of a vulnerable character, and uh, tragically, he decided, as we would colloquially say, walk into the urn, um, and he met a tragic end. Um, hence, the, the dilapidated state of the structure, um, but also, um, you know, as part of the planning process, the applicant really feels that the decision that we make here in the next half hour or so um, is going to be cast in judgment on whether the man existed at all officially, uh, and he would ask for recognition of both the man and his home. Now, I do realise that that last statement is one that you're not going to hear too often in a planning committee hearing. Um, however, probably myself and John are the only ones that will get to speak on behalf of Leo's memory and the older generation in Balik. Uh, the older generation in Balik are actually awaiting the outcome of this meeting, and they're hoping that the site of Leo's house can be brought back to life. I think they would regard it as a small victory and an appropriate nod to the past in our, in our fast-paced, ever-progressive world. If the application is granted, there will be a replacement dwelling constructed beside the structure of Leo's house, and it is the applicant's intention to secure the structure of Leo's home and use it for the enjoyment of a replacement dwelling, possibly as a recreation room outbuilding, and hopefully there will be a toast or two raised to its former occupant. Uh, normally cases heard here, will be about such things as integration into a landscape or a ribbon development or the suitability of an applicant for their particular site. This is definitely not one of those cases. Uh, I would commend the planning officer in charge of the file today as he has been very good with communication. And I think he himself has also realized that um, this is not a straightforward case. And he did deal with us particularly helpfully on, on submitting local testimony. Um, so I do believe that the planning department have not come to their decision in haste. However, we might disagree with their recommendation. We would strongly contest that the weight of social history and local testament, as well as the internal characteristics of the dwelling, would ensure that the granting of this permission would not set an undesirable precedent in this instance. There are cases that are black and white. This is not one of those cases. We feel the introduction of the planning committee to the planning process has been a very progressive move and we would respectfully suggest that it was for just such cases as these that the committee was tailor-made. And there is a provision in the planning process for the right decision to be reached here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, members, any questions for Martin? Hold on.
Councillor McCluckery, John. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Um, you refer to the, the, the social history and in one of the earlier photographs of a, of a map from the 1830s, we, we see, or, or maybe the later one, there's, there's a, a clump of houses there. So uh, knowing the history of Blig, not extensively, but uh, but I have a fair idea of what all went on there. Those don't seem to be agricultural buildings, so I take it, is there a mine or uh, an old mine somewhere close there? Because that, that the extensive iron ore mining around Blake in the early 19th and mid-19th century was a, a massive business at that stage. So is there any link between that maybe being a cluster of houses that belong to that mining industry? I wish I could say yes to that, but we actually don't have any information. We believe the Gollers were farming that land for generations, uh, and Leo was the last one. Um, after Leo tragically died, um, the applicant's family purchased the the site with the house on it. Um, it's uh, a little bit amazing that the house does not appear on the Ordnance Survey maps. We freely admit it doesn't. However, as we say, we have an entire generation of residents in Balik, who can uh, who can basically walk out there, point where his house is, and in this instance, I, I firmly believe that the maps have got it wrong. Okay, I have another speaker, Mark. Um, Councillor O'Reilly, Tom. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Martin, for the presentation. Just that was my point. Uh, was any explanation as to why uh, continuous maps have got it so wrong? I could imagine a little bit with tree cover could have hid some, but. Are we, no other explanation can be found as to why continuous maps are showing no building there. And this building is there as the photograph we're looking at as of today. We, we, we don't have a particular explanation for the lack of it on the maps. If we could get a slide back, um, and if we could zoom in, it's the one showing the outside of the building there, Darren. And I think we have some yellow writing where we're, where we're trying to explain. So the one on the right-hand side there. To go back one. Yes, if you wouldn't mind on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay, and if we can just zoom across. Uh, if you can get an appreciation, if you don't mind going down a bit. Sorry, this is your first day with this and we're getting awkward with you, but... Yeah, so I think if you take a look at the size of the trees around that structure, and if you look at the roof, th there's no way that the Ordnance Survey was going to pick that up, or the, the aerial photographs were going to pick it up. You can see to the left-hand side of the structure, you can see where the roots of the trees were cut, and you can also see the same thing on the right-hand side of the structure. So if you take that with the with the overgrowth, now I am very disappointed that it's not on the US map for the 1960s because there was a man actually living in that house. And as I say, you can walk down the street of Balik, pick out a person of a certain age, explain what you're looking to find out. They can literally take you and walk you out the commons and point to that structure and say that was Leo Galler's house. We have a situation where we're not able to rely seemly on the maps that is being provided. And that is a major, major problem here uh, for not alone this application, but for other applications in that sense of, the, of us relying on maps. Uh, okay, Chair, I'm, I'm happy enough with that. Just one follow up on that. Yeah, well, I have a question. You okay. Follow up from sure. Councillor Riley. Hey, just if I take this to modern circumstances where we have digital mapping systems, um, look at mapping errors are rare, but they do happen. Um, the first thing that we would have to do if we order an ordnance survey map into the office is we actually have to go out and check the measurements. Uh, we find this particularly on land registry maps where systems have been digitalized. And in some cases, again, very, very rarely, um, we do find that buildings can be missing. We do find that boundaries can be out as much as two or three metres. 
um, and we just have a natural skepticism towards even modern maps where the technology is better. I'm not saying this is a widespread serious problem, but I'm saying professionally, I've been in the business for 20 years. Off the top of my head, I can think of about six. Now, we do a lot of work, so six is not as, as big and scary of a number as it sounds, uh, but we definitely have experience of it. Martin, you asked for a deferment, uh, you got a deferment, we're back, we're back in front of here, but you're saying you have further information that you wanted to share with us, but you actually didn't share it with our officers. That's the first question. Uh, why did you not share those additional photographs with the officers? Secondly, you've said that the occupant was there for 20, 30 years, possibly. Is there any evidential um, basis for saying that apart from uh, people's testimony. I'm saying, did they pay rates? Did they have uh, sanitary visits? Any Anything official to actually establish that somebody lived at that address? Gabe, unfortunately, we're very much weak in that particular aspect of the application. Um, I would say again, Bleak, I can't believe that it's unique that it would have residents like this. Uh, there was one other particular case in Bleak up at the Ra Fort, where there was a famous gentleman called Bill Thorny, um, and he also lived in a similar dwelling. Um, now, we would know that these guys wouldn't have paid rates. As I say, they would have been possibly described as characters in their day, and um, they decided to withdraw from society to a degree. Um, but yet engaged, you know, to the to the degree that he would have had visitors. He obviously had a good enough relationship with the people who have provided the testimony. Um, it's not an easy one, um, but I think that the overwhelming testimony from the local people in Bleak um, should be given great consideration in the case. Um, and unfortunately, that's the decision that you're facing. You know, doesn't an entire town outweigh the presence of a rates receipt um, and does the social history aspect of the application. Now included with, uh, there's one particular good photograph here, which apologies, this is my first experience of this particular presentation. If we ever have to come back, I hope we don't, but uh, we, we'd have photographs submitted in, in a different way. Uh, one of the photographs, if you were looking at the ceiling of that cottage, and if you were looking at the, the tongue and groove sheeting on the cottage, if you didn't know anything about the outside of it, you would be saying, I am standing in an abandoned 1920s stone cottage. You know, somebody has timbered the walls. Somebody has made it a safe place. They've weatherproofed it. They've tried to insulate it, you know, albeit in the crude fashion of the 1940s, probably. Um, but that's the evidence we have. And, and we can't really come up with... There's no point in us saying that it's anything other than it is, but I do believe that there's enough there that it's a genuine case. That's okay. Any further questions? Right, Martin, I would ask you to withdraw. Go back to your seat, please. Thank you very much and, for your time. And I will call Councillor John Feeney forward. John, you have five minutes to present, um, no more, no less, and there will be no questions. It's merely a representation on behalf of the uh, applicant. So, you're good to go. Thank you, Chair. Good. There you go. It's good to be back. Uh, it's been four years. Uh, since we'll I've hold been. with a reserve cup. <laughs> well, this, this is a pretty easy decision. It, it's only really on one contention, whether or not you just believe this was a dwelling or not. <clears throat> and in today's standards, Everyone's going to say no way was that ever a dwelling, but I'm pretty sure anyone here that comes from a rural area will have known a little house like this. Kind of in today's terminology, you'd call it a tin shack. You know, when when I began chatting after after I seen seen this up, I chatted a few different people. You know, and everyone remembers Mr. Gala, and everyone remembers about three other characters in Bleak as well that all lived in the same. There was a Pat Freeburn lived in Curry. There was a little lady lived in Curry as well. And there were two tin houses, and then there was Bob, Bill Thornhill, who was known as locally as the Rat Man because he kind of 
domesticated the rats that was in his house. And in, from today's looking from today's perspective of that, it, it's unbelievable. But everyone in Balik, after a certain age, I'm not going to name the age, they all know him. And I've I've spoke to four or five other people as well as the three men that have made the submit submit submittance on behalf of Jerry. And you have to look at those people as well, the people who are saying it. Joe Lachlan is a former firefighter in Balik, and he's also a former businessman. He used to own a wee shop on the main street there. It was a wee shell garage. He, he knew everyone in the town. Uh, F Philip Cleary is a, was a manager in the pottery, uh, both from Bleak and then in Donegal. Similarly, lived out the commons, kn knew him as well. And, and, um, Paddy McCauley, as well as being the undertaker, he used to work for Tommy Daly in the grocery shop and used to deliver groceries out to, out to him, to Leo. And, um, also, he, there is no proof that he ever paid rates, but I, I have access to the Fermanagh Herald archives. And if you put in Leo Gala, from the, and do it in the decade of the 1960s. His name comes up again and again, Leo Gala, the Commons Balik. And it's, it's in relation to funerals. Anyone who died in the Balik or Garrison area or, and Ballyshannon area too, he must have been a well known man in the three locations. After the death, the month afterwards, they, they used to write an acknowledgement and they used to name every single person who sent a mass card. Must have been a big enough thing to be sending in a mass card at the time. And time and time again, it's, there's no house number, but there was no house numbers at the time. And there wasn't that many houses in the Commons, Blake. It's the, the Commons starts off at the chapel and it basically goes out to where Leo's house is. They made him in a handful of houses. There was the old school and the schoolmaster opposite it. There was, a, there was the Kellams up at the top of the Commons and maybe four or five houses after that. Leo, Leo Gallo was one of them. It's uh, it's 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 a sad fact that there's no there was no um, social care at the time. There was no there was no home helps. There was nobody there to help that man. He lived in a one room bedroom. On um, although I was think I was reminded too that although it's hard to believe it, if you're trying to rent a house in Dublin now, there's plenty of people living in one room flats where the kitchen, the toilet, and the bed is all in it. So it's almost as if we're coming full circle, but. It really, just take this under consideration. It's you just have to recognise whether that was a dwelling or not. It mightn't have had no running water, and it mightn't have had no electricity, but it was a man's home. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Finished on time. Could I ask you to withdraw back to your seat, please? Thank you. Uh, Darren. Uh, members, I've nothing really uh, to add to that. Uh, just to, to confirm, though, that the information on the letters of support. Uh, from the various people that have been named, Mr. McCauley, Cleary, Mr. Rooney and O'Glockland. That information is included in the report and a, a commentary on, on what they have said in support of the application. Uh, it wasn't included in my presentation, but it is within your report, uh, and you'll note that. Um, but I have nothing. I'm happy to take any questions, members. Members, any questions for Darren? Oh, councillor, the other councillor, Feely. Yes, um, it's, it's, it's not it's not really a question, it's more common down it's, it's it's the un the unusual thing as Thomas came in there about uh, there's no real evidence of it in the from nineteen sixty was nineteen sixty nine on there. But um just looking at that and 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 thanks Martin for the for the presentation there. The when you do look at it and the roof was all green and bushes and there's more trees around at that time. I think it was just just it, it was there, but it was camouflaged there. It was just camouflage. You can't see it, but it was there at that stage, and it was camouflaged there. So, I would be taken. That's why it hasn't came onto the onto the survey map that time. And I can make a proposal now. But if anybody else wants to come in before that, it's okay. Very much. Any other? Decision time, and I'm not talking about the portal. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Um, members, it's just, I suppose, to, to go back, there's a couple of couple of issues here. Um, there are some discussion on the social history um, and trying to retain the house just for, in the memory of, of Leo. And I, I suppose it's just, members, um, if we can keep to the material considerations, I don't think that will be material in your decision. Um, in terms of the aerial imagery and the OSNA uh, accuracy, look, that that's independent mapping. Um, I could see how it might be missed in one map, 
but it's maps from 1950, 2004 and 2020. I think it would be very unusual that it would be missed on the three maps, especially when it was there in the 1850s maps. Um, so it's actually went from being on the 1850s map to not being on any maps then, since then. Um, just in terms of the supporting statements, members, and you'll see the details on them, and there is some sort of conflict between the supporting statements. I think Mr. O'Loughlin refers to um, Leo being uh, dying in the 1970s, uh, where Mr. McCauley uh, refers to Mr. Gower dying in the 1980s. So, um, you know, normally when there's a consistency between statements, we wouldn't give those statements just as much weight as what, what we would if they were consistent. And there is an objector in this application, members, and they're very clear that there was no dwelling ever on this site. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Paul. Any further questions for Darren or indeed Paul? We have to come to a decision, members. Councillor Feely, Anthony. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I have to listen to, to Paul Lounge. I've taken all that in. And it's unusual, like it goes there in the 1600s and up to 1905. And it seems one missing for. To, uh, a number of years then, but I still think be looking at it, it was just camouflage there. Like, they like it's there now, and you know, be looking at it, somebody hasn't pulled the fast one and just put a, a new shed there because you know, be looking at it has been there a long time. And I know it's on you think be looking at it there, you, you'd say, How how could anybody live in that? But down, down around Garrison, cash up as far as they're gone, need to still a pile of them. We, I, I, well, was houses scattered about? Even there's, there's, there's one on an old farm of our own way in the middle of nowhere. And, and the young fellow, we often be out there looking at cat and, and they'd tell him, he says, Dad, nobody could have lived in that. And they did. And the exact same as that as that there. So I would be proposing that we go against the office re recommendation on item two here, where it says it hasn't got the character of a, of a dwelling. And I'm saying it has the character of a dwelling. And you know, we're looking at it there and, and you would probably see it better. I know that photograph doesn't do it justice there and there's a flat reef on it and there would have been a chimney on that but the chimney has probably fell down since but to me it, it, it is a dwelling so I'm, if, if that's, I don't know if that's enough for Robert, but that's, I'm going to make that proposed on, 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 on number two there. Thank, thank you me. Anthony, thank you. I'll just ask Darren, do you need any more clarity? Uh, sorry Councillor Feely, so the report does include um, three reasons for refusal. Um, I have just really the, the critical issues are on the screen. Um, you have commented then on the second one that the building to be replaced does not exhibit the essential characteristics of a dwelling. Uh, and you have commented on that. Um, just in relation to the other two issues, though, that the new dwelling does not cluster and consolidate or group within existing established buildings, as there's only one building. The policy requires there to be more than one. Uh, and again, then in relation to the third reason for refusal, that it's not located within the curtilage surrounding the original dwelling, because the original Cartilage is no longer there, as you'll note from the, the aerial maps. Those field hedges have all been, or boundary hedges have all been removed, and the building just sits within the wider field. So if, if the member wishes just to put forward a commentary in relation to those two issues. Yeah, yes, yes, Darren. Well, I, I know on one of the, the, the previous, the earlier photos, there was a another shed there, a building, and I'd say that was a, an outside barn which would have been at all houses years ago, and that would probably would have stood for a while, and it probably would have fell sooner than that, you know, but with, with storm and everything. I'd say that was a barn, more or less. And on the, the cartilage, well, you still know there was a hedge there. You can see, you can see as you've seen on the photographs, you can still see the small um, bits of sticks and hedges sticking up there, so you know there was a cartilage there at some time. I know it's not there now, but you know it was there. And I, th I thought if it was a replacement dwelling on the farm we didn't need lots of buildings, but do, I thought we didn't need that, but... Am I right? Well, right. Under policy DU3, all, all development must cluster and consolidate a group with an established existing buildings. So this is plural. I say there's only one building on the site. There may have been other buildings historically on this site, um, you know, outhouses or other buildings, but in this case, it's only a single building. Uh, so you cannot cluster or consolidate or group with a group of buildings, plural. There's only one. But I think as a member points out, this is a replacement dwelling policy. So there may be avenue if you wish to explore in that. 
uh, about how that uh, that allows you to, to get around the requirement to, to group with these established buildings, plural. The original building will be retained, so at least there will be one, mm -hmm. if a member wishes to expand on that. Uh, in terms of the cartilage, as say, it has been removed, so there is no cartilage there. Mm -hmm. There is a side boundary field hedge, but there is no cartilage there. So again, if you wish to just expand on, on that issue. Well, I, I think we should go with the replacement dwelling, if, if that was the case. And and I still say there was a barrel there. I know it's, it's, it's not there now, but it definitely was there at one stage. Sorry, just for clarity, if it's not there now, even though it was before and demolished, it mm -hmm. can't be taken into account with regard to the policy. Yeah. So the, any of the policies actually deal with what's on the ground. So I think... Uh, our officer is actually pointing you in a certain direction, uh, Anthony, so you've got to deal with that. So, Darren, it's, it's more or less a, it would have to go for a placement well in the Well, oh, I think I think the, the, the point the member's making is that you're noting that there is one building mm -hmm. and it is to be retained. There are no other buildings. So if this is to be permitted as a replacement dwelling, it's in the full knowledge that there is only one building to uh, to cluster with. Yes, uh, and uh, it's uh, in that full factual knowledge. You're not going, in, you know, you're not saying or making up that there's another building. So you have been clear that you are aware there's only one building. It's a replacement of that building. Yes, yeah, one building at the moment. But there was, I know, that, yeah, and there was a building there before. I take that. Yes, one building at the moment. Yes, that's that's what that's what the proposal I'm making. If that's okay. Okay. Just just for the record, what you're saying is that. Your recollection is there's a building there. It was and does exhibit uh, the characteristics, in your opinion, of a residence that somebody um, in the 60s or 70s may have inhabited who wanted to sort of withdraw to a certain extent from ordinary society. What you're looking for is you're looking for a replacement dwelling and you're leaving the existing in place. Yes, I, and, and not, not may have lived there. I, I don't, did live there. That's okay. Yeah. Yep. Councillor McCann, Stephen. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to Martin and to John for their presentations, and it's an interesting one for sure. Uh, I do think that the evidence provided by Martin and the photographs on the screen clearly show this building was a, was a house. Uh, the fireplace is clear to be seen, and uh, I accept what the agent is saying in terms of the tongue and groove and wooden panelling. That would be characteristics for me of a house. Chairman shaking his head. Say we haven't seen the evidence, no, uh, Councillor. Yeah, on the on the on the on the screen. I did the, the, the back end. Yep. Yep. panelling yep. on the fireplace. So yep. I'm happy to accept that as a yep. as a decorative feature or maybe even insulation of a house. You know, uh, so I'm happy to just second and uh, taking into account as well. Obviously, at, at the, looking at the policy quite here, you know, uh, it's clear. You know, given what I've heard, uh, and I accept that there was a there was a gentleman living this property, and uh, I'm happy to second the proposal. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Councillor McClockery, John. Thank you. Um, again, I, I've seen similar type dwellings that people lived up in up until probably the, the 1980s it, within rural areas, these one bedroom houses, and, and again, similar sort of traits. Um, I'm basically asking Darren a question to help me make my decisions. Can we put a condition that the the historic cartilage that we know existed is reinstated? Um, you could, uh, Councillor. However, the cartilage that was there, as with most old properties, had a very very small cartilage because we didn't want to waste agricultural land. Really, you know. So, uh, if you were to put it back, it would really limit the size of the new dwellings cartilage in the garden area around it. Um, but what we can do as part of the reserve matters is work with the applicant to try and establish as many of those as possible uh, and try and reflect and replicate the old sort of layout that was there uh, and try and reintegrate the building in terms of the historic nature of the site. But I think it would be going too far to require you to put all boundaries back. But I'm, I'm sure the agent and applicant would be willing to work with the planning office on that. And that helps me with my decision. Councillor McGuire. Chair, and again, it's, it's back to the, the issue that Councillor O'Reilly raised in relation to the maps. The, the fact that the maps uh, at a certain year didn't show a building there, 
but yet the more historical ones did show maybe two buildings there. Uh, just going forward, is there any way we can resolve that uh, with any future applications that would come before us? Because obviously if we restricted ourselves to the map that didn't show a building, it would have been very difficult for the applicant or anyone else to try and convince us. Otherwise, when the evidence show, presented to us as the committee showed no buildings there, but uh, thanks to Darney, did show the more historical maps, but did show a bit. And so that may become an issue going forward. Uh, just uh, how would we resolve that? I think the issue we have, this is the, the first application under this particular um, suite of uh, policy, sub-policies. And it's useful that we're actually trying to tease out the issues in that regard. The, the, ad, the agent has referred to it, and I would speak directly to the agent now, there's a certain level of information that you went into a slight bit more detail and probably could have expanded that we as a committee and indeed our officers, first of all, would need it to have oversight and sight of to actually give us a better grounding and background to what's going on. So I think if anything like this happens again under the suite, I would um, encourage our agents to actually do a lot more delving into the social history and background, is that there is a mismatch between mapping reality on the ground. We as a committee would need reasonable substantive evidence to actually veer away from the evidential um, database presented by the maps. So it's just for, for our benefit uh, for that going forward. So I'm going to ask Paul, yeah, and not just, that I'm saying anything, I'm just noting. Uh, Councillor McGuire, it's, it's just really to say, you know, like this application, like others enforcement cases, the mapping will only be one element, you know, and even if it did show a building, the map doesn't tell you what the building was or what it was used for, it'll just be the area. So it's all the other testimony then that goes with it, um, whether it be rates, bills, supporting statements, whatever it might be. So it's all together. Um, and look, I suppose um, I was just looking there at, at, at OSNI accuracy and they, they say that they can get it accurate, they be within one metre, 92% or something of maps. So, but as I say, it, that's it's not the only matter we'll, we'll consider it. There, there's, um, you know, we'll be looking at comprehensive um, pieces on, on different matters. Um, thanks, Chair. Not at all. Oh yeah, uh, sorry, before I take the two councillors here in the chamber, um, Philip, Phil Kingston, our legal advisor wants to come in. Philip, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And again, members, it's really just to re reiterate the points that, that, that Paul has made there and also that you yourself have made, Chair, in relation uh, to this. The weighing up of evidence is exactly one of the functions that this committee is intended to perform. Um, the mapping is but one element of it. Um, your own local knowledge in relation to these matters is exactly one of the factors that that uh, is a benefit of planning being uh, restored to local authorities. Um, so the the evidence that individual members have been able to put forward is certainly something that that could and should be taken into consideration. Clearly, objective evidence is always the strongest evidence and therefore deviating away from the evidence which is contained within the ordnance survey maps is not something which should be done lightly um, but I've listened to the debate in relation to this and members have clearly considered this in a great deal of detail on this occasion and I think it's entirely proper that members should should weigh their own uh, views on the evidence that has been presented in front of them in relation to this particular application. Clearly future applications in relation to this matter would benefit greatly uh, if objective evidence and paper evidence could be presented in advance to officers so as they can consider that evidence as well. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much as ever, Philip, for your, your pearls of wisdom. I was going to say words, but no, they're pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Uh, two councillors now. Councillor Campbell, Glenn. Yes, Chairman, uh, will I add my thanks to, um, to Philip for that uh, contribution? And also, I wanted to, to, to thank um, Martin and John for, the, for bringing that, uh, if you like, uh, evidence forward to the committee because it has been very important to help us um, reach a decision and, and I do find myself on, on the balance of things supporting uh, Councillor Feely's uh, proposal 
And I've no doubt that um, in that period there was many structures like that, tin house structures actually. Uh, my own father talks about when he moved to Kildrum Dromore, uh, it had been a tin house and, and, and that was in the early 70s. And that his brother, when he was building the new building, saying that you'll you'll never actually get a warmer house because it was tin with wooden paneling and sawdust for insulation, you know, which um and it's something my father would kind of reflect on that it probably wasn't much warmer in in the time since. But uh, in any case, I do think in this particular application I I'm supportive of the proposal that Councillor Philly has made. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor O'Reilly, Tom. I'm not sure whether I want to pursue this line of, of question here in front of where we make a decision, but I don't think it makes any difference on the, on the actual decision making. I would take a contrary view to some of the comments that Paul has sort of uh, passed, indeed Philip, uh, that uh, while At this level of, of standard of accommodation, uh, the, we have a sort of a reliance now on looking for modern day um, evidence uh, to support one way or another uh, uh, decision. In those days, there wasn't those sort of things around and all of that. That's one point I make. The second point I make is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we can't be 100% sure to rely on the map evidence, then we need, as a planning department, to not rely on the agents or indeed, as uh, the inference was being made there about a local knowledge of the planning committee members, but rather that the planning uh, department itself uh, is able to dig up now, I am just wondering where that leaves the planning department in so far as that uh, each time a, there is no uh, sort of a historical map evidence, uh, how far do you need to go down with your planning officer to be able to dig out uh, local information? There is, I, do, I don't mind if it's missing on a, on a yearly map or on, on a very short period of time, but there is a consistently large period of time there that there seems to be uh, substantial evidence uh, saying that there was a man living in that. And we have to take into consideration the standard that that would have been and in the time of it. I doubt that we'll come across an awful lot of these cases as we as we go forward, and I'm sure even less in the time ahead. But I'm just a little bit uneasy of where it it leaves the planning department, you know, in so far as where do where does the ball of string end? How far do you need to go down to then uh, double check that the map is right? I suppose once we find an anomaly on the map, we then have a duty to actually go forward uh, to some length to actually verify uh, why that anomaly is there. And I'm just wondering that when Martin uh, and John and, and the locals could uh, unearth uh, evidence and, and testimony from people, is that not part of the uh, responsibility of planning department to actually be able to go that far to see if that evidence is there uh, before actually uh, putting forward a refusal or an approval, whichever the case may be? So it's not particular on this directly to this uh, case, but it, there is a there's a bit of an uh, uh, an anomaly there that's sitting facing us, chair. So could I suggest that we, we're going to have future workshops, you know, in regard to the outturn of policies and working through issues, um, not just in the planning committee, but the local development plan that carry forward something like this. There is also the issue, and it will be debated, how much supporting evidence that the agent supplies on behalf of the applicant that is cross-referenced and checked by our planning officers but would have to say it is not our planning officer's job to actually substantiate an application on behalf, you know, made by an agent. You know, so there's there's I mean, Chair, I think you're getting my you're not getting my point here. My point is that we in my view, as a planning department, we cannot definitively say no 
unless we act when we see that there is an anomaly within the system uh, without actually testing as to why that anomaly is there. And it shouldn't be, in my view, the the uh, the job of the uh, applicant or their agent to actually provide that information. If we if we see that there is a, a an anomaly between the evidence that is on the ground and the evidence that we are relying on on a map uh, version of evidence, then we need to investigate why that evidence gap is there. Yeah, I, I can understand that. The problem is it's done by another agency and it's trying to get them to actually justify, I, I'll admit, have they made a mistake or not? So you're actually going down probably a tunnel and you're not sure where the tunnel is. No, no. And I'm not discounting what you're saying, Tom, and I agree with it. I think we'll probably have to discuss it uh, in, an, in another situation uh, out with this. I think there's been substantive uh, discussion on uh, this regard, and I think we're probably coming towards a decision time because we have a, a proposal that's been duly proposed and seconded here. Any further speakers? Paul, do you want to say something? If, I, if I could just come in, I, I think one of the key things here is to note that it's not just one piece of evidence. I think that's one of the things, and then you're looking at actually building that, and the planners don't look at one piece of evidence in, in, in isolation for any of the applications. So there is an onus on that information coming forward, so the planners can actually examine it and check the robustness of, of everything within it. But I think there's been an issue raised this afternoon in terms of the, the maps, and I would suggest perhaps members might um, like us to actually write to um, OSNI just to actually clarify the, the position. If you were happy enough, we can take that um, action forward just to address that particular issue because we don't want an issue where maps are being set aside um, for future future applications in terms of consideration. So if members were happy with that solution, and, and I think, sorry, um, Councillor Irvine as well, the suggestion about perhaps bringing forward um, a case study or a number of case studies in terms of a, a future workshop to sort of thrash out some of the issues yeah. as well would be helpful. Right, Councillor McCann, Stephen, are you yeah, happy to propose you. that? Happy just exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I'll ask Councillor Riley, are you happy to second? Yep, okay, all agreed that we do that? Yep. Right, we have a proposal that we go contrary to the officer's recommendation and the proposal is to approve uh, the application that's made by Councillor Anthony Feely and seconded by Councillor McCann, isn't that right? Yep, okay, and there's no further... Uh, proposals. Are we all in favour? Is that unanimous? Yep, unanimous. Yep. Thank you very much, Darren. Okay, members. So the recommendation of officers for LA 10 2022-496 was to refuse planning permission, uh, subject to four reasons. Members have gone contrary to the officer's recommendation uh, and have granted uh, planning permission. In respect of conditions, members, uh, again, similar to other applications, if I could request, they are delegated back to officers just to attach standard conditions that relate to the ridge height, the siding, design and appearance, landscaping and uh, various other issues. Uh, we can approve those. I, I've got an indication with Councillor Feely and Councillor McCann that that's okay. I propose that. Councillor McLaughlin. Hold on to that. Yep. All right, Chair. Don, will that include the uh, cartilage bit? Thank you. Okay. That's that one dealt with. We'll now go on to application number 52, and that is LA10 bar 2023 bar 1414. That's a proposal for a dwelling and garage for a Mr. B. Keys. Okay, members. So, application number two, LA10 2023 1414, is an outline application by Mr. Keys for proposed dwelling and garage. And this uh, location then is a site 120 metres east of 21 Glen Road in Quinn. Recommendation of officers is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report. I'm subject to the two reasons. Members will recall this application was presented to the committee last month. Uh, and was deferred at the request of officers uh, as the agent in their speeding rights uh, referred to uh, the issue of flooding for the adjacent field. Uh, planners have now reviewed uh, the status of this adjacent field uh, and have identified and confirmed that it is not within the floodplain from a water course, uh, but it is partially affected by flooding from surface water during periods of excess rain. Uh, and I'll, ex I'll expand on that more in the presentation, members. Just to take you through again the details, the site location plan 
is on the screen and you can see the site identified by the yellow star with the red line then around the boundary of the site and the adjacent land then in the control of the applicant then is to the left in blue uh, giving you an idea then members of the nearby buildings so our site then is a the yellow star in the center of the slide to the left of the site is number 21 uh, which is a dwelling facing onto the road with a, an outbuilding beside it to the right of the site is number 19 Again, the dwelling beside the road, and then further along the road, uh, but turn left on the Drum Scry Road, there's another property. So two issues obviously apply. The application has been made uh, under HOU 13. Uh, it was initially for an infill application, and then has been amended by the applicant to, to go more of a rounding off opportunity. I'll just take you through the two, two policies within HOU 13. So paragraph two, first of all. A proposal is contrary to HUV 13 and is not sustainable development as the proposed site is not within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage of at least three buildings, each within their own defined curtilage. So the site then is in the centre of the slide. You can see the yellow star. So we have a property to the left, number 21, and we have a property to the right, number 19. So those are two buildings, each within their own defined curtilage. The other building then nearby is number 79, Drumscraw Road, but that's further around the corner and doesn't have a frontage or any, uh, anything onto Glen Road with a large gap then between number 19 and this property. The agent has supplied a site design limits supporting statement and I'll just take you through it members just to make sure you're fully informed. So the site is the red line in the centre of the slide and then to the left is this, the blue area in blue. You then have a green area around number 21. To the right of the application site is number 19 which is in blue and then there's another property in red, which is identified as property three. I'll come on to that in a second. So if you imagine you're at the site frontage then, where the yellow uh, annotation is, the site photo one, you're at the site frontage looking into the site. And that's an image then looking into the existing field. You can see over to number 21 over in the left-hand side. Another image then coming up. So you're in front of number 21 on the road looking at that property. So this is number 21. And you can see it then the bungalow side at right angles to the road with the, the garage out the back. The curtilage then is defined by the laurel heads that runs around the extensive outside of the property. Going back up the road then to the uh, adjacent property to the right hand side of the application site. So this is the area in blue. You're standing at the front of that property, number 19. And that's a photograph then looking at it. So again, another property at right angles to the road. So then to the right hand side of number 19, there's an area in red, remember, you can see in the screen there, and that's identified on this site design limits plan as property number three. So if you're standing on the road, site photo four then is looking at that property, uh, and that's that building there, members. Uh, as you recall from last month, that shed does not have planning permission and is unauthorised and is subject to a council enforcement investigation. Um, so it has to be discounted from today's consideration as it does not benefit from planning permission. It is not up more than five years as well, so it's not immune from any enforcement action. In relation to paragraph two, the proposal is currently to HUV 13, as there's not three buildings, each with their own defined curtilage along that frontage, uh, and development will also detract from the rural character. In relation to the, the paragraph one of HUV 13, the agent submitted a supporting statement on Tuesday, 19th of September, relating to the issue of rounding off. And uh, this is the, the the drawing that they've submitted. So you have the, the plan in the centre and a series of photographs on the left hand side. So I'll just go through those. Uh, again, that's the, the image then that has been submitted in support of the application. And there's a series of photographs. So the first photograph then is on the left hand side, members. You can see site photo one. So you'll be standing at the, the uh, adjacent property looking in at our application site. And you also then have site photo two, which is on the other road looking back on ourselves. So you can see site photo one, which shows the, the unauthorised shed and the farm buildings at the rear of it. And then site photo two is on 76 Drumscry Road, looking towards our application site over the fields. And then two more photographs. So there's a site photos three and four. So three should be looking at the unauthorised building and four then is looking in the opposite direction. So you can see site photo three is looking at the unauthorised building and then the probably Drumscry Road on the other side of it. And four then is looking along the Glen Road with the unauthorised building on the right hand side. And finally then site photo five is up at the junction uh, looking across the fields at the adjacent farmyard and buildings. So that's site photo five.
So in relation to the issue of paragraph one, members rounding off the uh, applications, it's not considered to meet uh, many of the criteria within paragraph one. It will not result in the rounding off of a gap within an existing group of buildings, as those buildings are well dispersed and separated within the countryside, so they're not linked together and do not appear as a group of buildings. There's numerous visual breaks and fees uh, which separate the buildings. Uh, the site is not visually linked with an established group of buildings. It's not bounded in at least two sides with other development. Uh, the site cannot be absorbed through rounding off and consolidation. It will significantly alter the character and appearance of the area, resulting in a suburban style buildup of development along the road and create a ribbon of development along that road, and also will result in further development opportunities. Just in relation to that key point, members, so that would be point uh, criteria H of HUE 13. The application is contrary to the policy as it would result in further development opportunities. So the applicant owns the field, uh, the wider field. He's applied for the right-hand side of that field where the yellow star is, but also owns the, the, the larger bit of the land to the left above the red star and identified in blue. On the site uh, plan, you can see the Ordnance Survey flyover map. You can see the field members, so the application cites the yellow star. If there's a building approved there and developed there, that will leave another half of the field on the left. Uh, where the, a second dwelling could be constructed. Although the red line of our application site does extend right up to the public road and include more or less all of the site frontage, there would be nothing to stop the applicant from developing a paired access into that uh, other half of the site. So development of this site would result in further development opportunities on that left-hand side. In respect of that point, the agent uh, referred last month to the flooding on that half of the field. So you can see on the left-hand side, the slide shows the DFI Rivers Climate Change Zone flood zones. And the site is not affected by any water course flooding from any rivers or streams. On the right-hand side, though, the site is affected by the surface water flood maps. So that's the area of pink or purpley color. And it does affect at least half of that left-hand side of the field. However, the planning policies and the plan strategy do not prevent development within areas that are affected by surface water flooding. So these are sites that during periods of heavy rain may be affected by uh, surface water flooding temporarily while that water then uh, releases into the water courses. Policy FLD02 would apply for development affected by surface water flooding. Uh, the Council will not support new development at risk from surface water flooding or which would increase the risk of flooding elsewhere unless it is demonstrated through a drainage assessment that adequate drainage measures will be put in place so as to effectively mitigate the flood risks to proposed development and from the development elsewhere. That, uh, that uh, text members really allows developers to come along and say, I'm going to build within an area affected by surface water flooding, and this is how I will accommodate the surface water flooding uh, so it won't impact on any neighbours and won't cause any flooding elsewhere. It doesn't mean you get refused because you're affected by surface water flooding and there have been a number of applications within the council that have been granted on sites like this where developers have been able to show they will be able to accommodate the surface water flooding. I'll not go through all of the criteria again, members, but you can see the applications currently to paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 of HU 13 and is not sustainable development for those reasons. Uh, so finally, members, for the reasons listed within the report and in line with the wording of the transitional arrangements in the 2015 LDP regulations, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the local development plans or reasons stated, and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved contrary to the local development plan. I recommend the application is refused for four broad reasons. It's not a rounding off opportunity. It's not an infill opportunity. It would alter the rural character of the area by reason of a build-up development and is an important visual break in the landscape and would also create a ribbon of development. Thanks very much, Darren. We have representations now, first of all, by the agent, Mr. David McKinley via WebEx. David, he's still online? Uh, yep, I'm here. Uh... Uh, See you. I'll stop the video because sometimes it reacts to the, the speaking. So <laughs> if you're all right, just to prove that I'm here. <laughs> Did you say your your white hair there? Thank That's you. it. Uh, nearly all gone. You have, <laughs> you have ten gone. minutes. Away you go. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, for allowing me to speak on behalf of Mrs. Beatrice Keys. Uh, the development of a new dwelling as a rounding off will permit it where all the following criteria are met. The proposed dwelling will result in the rounding off of a gap within the existing group of buildings which are cited outside of FAR. Um, Darren, if you go back to 45, please, uh, slide 45, I think it was. Or maybe even the original. 
Uh, there. Uh, we'll go back forward. One actually is 46. That's probably better. You can see from the overview what we are assessing as the rounding off. The heavy dashed line encumbers six number dwellings and a set of th three sets of farmyards, all within approximately 150 metres of the proposed site. You will also note the larger site frontages either side of the proposed site, and particularly property one, number 21, which is shaded in green, uh, as a frontage of 120. It's access into the site that gives a wide frontage of property one. The property shaded in blue has a, has a frontage, and, a small, and, a, and a, this one is similar to our site frontage. In this case, the site will be initially rounded off between sites 21 green shading and 17 blue shading. Sorry, I'm calling it 17. Darn, is it 19? I've taken 17 off the Ordnance Survey map, so my apologies if there's confusion. 17 and 19 are one of the same. Uh, 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 as you drive south on the Drumscraw Road and look across where Photo 2 is located, Darn, if you can go to Photo 2, please. Yeah, the bottom side. As you drive down towards the junction at uh, towards the junction on Glen Road, seventy six Drumscraw Road. Yes, does access onto Drumscraw Road. You can also see the gym, which we're not allowed to mention. We also see dwelling number seventeen. Uh, we can also see or nineteen. We can also see its garage nineteen. We can see twenty one in the distance. Uh, that. <laughs> Reads the site enclosed visually between number 76 from Square Road and the dwelling number 21. This is the rounding off require, require, required in part A of HOU 13. Um, part B of HOU 13 is the existing group of buildings appears a focal point at a junction of roads or on the landscape when viewed with a public vantage point. We have the junction of Drum Square Road and Glen Road as the criteria of the meeting of roads. As photo two indicates, the dwellings are all visually linked. Uh, photo four was taken on the Glen Road with the gym. Uh, I'll probably be the next one. Oh, darn. Uh, you can see as you look up the Glen Road, uh, and you can see the outline of 19 just behind it. Uh, so uh, where are we now? Meeting as photo indicates, the dwellings were all visually linked. Photo four was taken on the Glen Road with the gym. You would read as a row of dwellings all the way to number 21 Glen Road, further up the Glen Road. We also read a, read this photo with the farm buildings on the left. There's a farm building group on the other side. The uh, the proposed dwelling is visually linked with an existing group of buildings constituting a minimum of four buildings, three of which are dwellings. Refer to photo four again, you will read 76 Tom Grass from Scra Road with the gym, 17 Glen Road or 19 Glen Road outlined in blue, uh, 21 Glen Road shaded in green, all with their individual garages. Uh, the requirements here is that you need four buildings of which three should be dwellings. So you have 76 on our road, you have 17 or 19 Glen Road, and you have 21. Uh, each with their own defined cartilages. We have three dwellings and two number garages. We can we conclude we comply with this part of each of you 13. Uh, the site provides a suitable degree of enclosure and is bounded on at least two sides with other developers in the cluster. Refer to the plan, if you go back to 45 or 46 again, please, Darn. Uh, you will see 21 Glen Road shaded green. There, you see, something bounds the red line site. The red line goes right over to the entrance, leaving no room for a second entrance into remaining blue land. Again, refer to the dwelling shaded green. This is the site bounded on its right. Basically, the site is bound on both sides by development. It also has a strong planted boundary on its eastern boundary. We conclude that this application meets with Part D uh, of each of 13. The proposed dwelling does not result in the coalescence of two visual distinct groups of buildings. I keep going back to photo photo two again. We'll read as a as a photo as, as, as read as a focal entity as you drive down the Scrow Road. In fact, as you pass the farmyard and the buildings on the Scrow Road, which is the grey buildings further up in the plan, uh, towards the junction of Glen Road, it's even more apparent. Basically, the 19, 17, 20, and seventy six all read as one entity as you pass the farmyard coming coming down the Scrow Road, driving south towards Glen Road. Uh, photo sh photograph three shows the relationship from the Glen Road and the buildings on that building on the Dumscrow Road. We, we have one group as a visual entity. The proposed development can be absorbed on the existing cluster through rounding off and consolidation and will not significantly alter its existing character. The site is ideal for a dwelling and its dwellings on both sides. The, buildings, the building will be traditionally built, therefore, will not alter the existing character as it fills a small gap between 21 and 17 or rounding off. 
uh, site 21 Shade of Green has been the last dwelling in this group on the Glen Road and will not visually intrude into the open countryside uh, by the nature of be, be, being between 21 and, and 17 Stoke 90. Uh, the proposal will not create or add to ribbon development. It can't add to ribbon as it's within two number of dwellings and its class is rounding off. If that's the case, this application can't be treated as ribbon. Uh, if, it's, if it's construed as being within a been within a rounding off opportunity. Um, the proposed dwelling will development will not result in any further development opportunities. The area outlined in blue is within a surface water designation. I, I understand that and I understand you can you can just about treat surface water. The fact is the fact is I've had a couple of applications with a little bit of surface water eating into the site from a waterway. That give me serious problems with a mortgage. And I, I know that's not material consideration, but it is when you can't get a mortgage and something to build. Uh, we can't build on it. Uh, and, and in any case, we have the red line site extends right across to the complete frontage over to the green site. And, and that's where the entrance unusually comes right across the frontage off that blue site, uh, leaving no opportunities to access the retained blue outline site. In any case, I would suggest a planning approval would be difficult to obtain as we actually sit behind another access. Uh, Darren's correct. Look, uh, I wasn't aware until the last planning committee meeting that the um, that the gym had no planning permission. So I, I can't use I can't use that opportunity as a, as a, as, a, as an infill site, unfortunately. Because to be fair, it was one of the first ones that would have worked successfully. As a as a as as a as a as an infill site, uh, as you had two buildings one side and and each with their separate uh, separate accesses and cartilage. So that's me. I'm finished. I I'll take questions or I can and and I'll answer them accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Members, any questions for David? It's done them into silence, David. <laughs> so unusual, unusual. It's okay. <laughs> well, no, it's not that unusual. Uh, Karen, rounding up, please, or summing up. Uh, uh, members, I have nothing really to want to add to the previous comments and what's in the report. Just to remind, there are the four reasons for refusal. Uh, it's not a considered rounding off opportunity. It's not an infill, uh, and the gym building is is unauthorized, so it cannot be taken into account uh, in today's discussion. Um, and the other issues relate to the visual impact of the new building on the countryside. So. Just refer you to the comments in the report and the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. We're again at decision time. You've heard the comments from the agent. You've heard Darren's presentation of the report. I need um, a proposal. Some people say silence and golden, but uh, not not in this situation. I'd like to hear some dialogue, please. Councillor Campbell, Glenn. Well, Chairman, I just wanted maybe to refer back to the the contribution from uh, the agent uh, and the argument made for you know um, rounding it off. Um, what's the officer's views on that? For example, um, I believe the argument is that it is, in fact, bound on two sides there um, from the neighbouring properties, and also there's a hedge on the eastern side, and also in relation to the the meeting of roads. Um, what's sort of what's the response to those arguments put forward in terms of the the, the rounding off criteria? Darren. I can just assess members. So on, on the screen, members, really, is the, the application site, and it's been zoomed in there. So you can see the property to the left and the property to the right. Um, well, the policy for rounding off um, in the plan strategy of 13 
It talks about the uh, a new dwelling will be permitted as a rounding off opportunity where all of the criteria are met. So there's through a, a list of them and you have to meet them all to meet the policy. In terms of the rounding off, really what you're looking at is uh, to see and identify whether there's a cluster of buildings. So what is a cluster? Well, a cluster is a loose group of buildings. Uh, I think that would be a general everyday meaning of it. When you're in this site here, there is a, a number of buildings, or there are a number of buildings in the wider area. That's accepted. The agent's correct. He's factually correct. He's pointed those all out. The question is whether they appear as a cluster or as a group, and that's where they don't. The buildings are all spaced out. There's fields between them. As you can see, this is a prime example of that, where you have a, a, a large field between number 17 or 19 and 21. Those fields disperse the settlement pattern and create a rural character to the area. So when you're driving about the area, yes, you notice houses, but they are dispersed. There's a rural character to the area. There's not a buildup of development uh, where you see a lot of buildings all stuck together and you can stick a house in and round off that group uh, of buildings. I say the policy clarification is assistant members here that says the careful positioning of an additional dwelling within an existing group of buildings has the potential of reinforcing locally distinctive settlement patterns and local identity without detracting from rural character. And that's the key test before you today, members. This area here has a dispersed rural character to it. Uh, it's not uh, an area where there's a buildup of development and you're putting a house into it and it won't change that character or change that appearance. By losing these gaps, you are going to create a buildup of development. You're going to create a ribbon of development along that road. At the moment, you've got 21, you've got 19 with a big gap in the middle. Approval of a house in there will lose that gap, remove that important visual break and create a line of three buildings along the edge of the road. In relation to the, the other criteria, um, the uh, bound on at least two sides with other development in the cluster, you can see from the red line of the application side, it does extend up to uh, very close proximity to the neighbouring laneway. And the agent says it extends right up to it. Uh, I would argue maybe that it doesn't. The, the boundary is defined there with the green line. The view of myself was a, as an officer looking at that would be that the red line does not extend right up to that boundary of that uh, laneway into the house. Uh, even if it did, members, to say that the policy is talking about bound uh, on at least two sides with other development within the cluster. Well, there's no cluster for a start. The view of myself would be that it doesn't extend right up to the garden area, the house area. So it's not filling a gap in between the buildings. You still have the large area in blue. And I think that's an important point, members, that is very difficult um, to, to ignore. The final criteria, uh, each, the proposed development will not result in any further development opportunities. That, and I'm not prejudging or predetermining any application that may come in, that site there is a suitable size for a new dwelling. You could put a house in there, it would, would, it would fit in. There would be a garden area. There's an access position can come in between the red line and the, the green area there. It can be paired with the access to the application site and the right-hand side. It's very, very difficult to say that it will not result in further development opportunities because if the right-hand side of the site is approved, the left-hand site will, will naturally follow with it. Okay, members, thanks for that clarification, Darren. Councillor McCrockery, John. Thank you, Darren. There was a slide with a, that's the one, yeah, the circle over the top of it. Um, what, 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 what sort of diameter is, is that, I mean, the, the agent alluded it was about 150 metres. Is that from top to bottom 150 metres or is it 150 metres around the proposed site? I, should have probably asked that at the time, but it's... Ask the agent that. Ask the agent that if you want, I'm sure. No, it's up the agent. Uh, I, you I, had I, your opportunity, Councillor McClockery, to ask the agent. I'm not bringing the agent back. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, Paul, I mean, Paul wants to come in here. Hold on, John. Yeah, go on, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I think just at the bottom of the slide there, it, it says that um, there's six number of dwellings uh, within approximately 180 metres of the site, so it's 180 metres. Thanks, Chair. Thank you.
If you're thinking uh, members are going contrary to the officer re a recommendation and approving, there are four items for refusal and each of the four items will have to be addressed if you're making a contrary proposal. Just to remind you. This was before the committee before and was deferred. Uh, you're seeing it for a second time. The um, the agent did present, and we've got Darren's counter representations, for want of a better word, as well as his representations. This is now decision time. So. I again say, if you're going to think about going contrary to the officer's recommendation, you have to address all four reasons for refusal. Councillor McLaughlin. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Sure. Um, I'm looking at the four reasons uh, and and whilst the agent has made a very strong, strong case, and to quote a previous councillor from a different mandate, it is a good site. <laughs> but I don't think, I can't see how we can make it currently. But that is not to say in six months' time that it might fit. But at the moment, I can't see a way of making it fit unless any of the other councillors, and I would, I would love to see it. Being able to fit, I think it, it would fit into the area, but I, I can't make it fit all the criteria. And, and unless any of my colleagues can come up with reasons to make it fit, I, I can't see how we, at this stage we can go against the officer's recommendations. So that's, I, I'll wait to be contradicted by my colleagues, but I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going to contradict you, Councillor. Are you making a proposal, John? You're proposing to go with the officer's recommendation to refuse. Okay. Do I have a seconder? Members, is the proposal on the table? Is there a seconder? Somebody willing to second? Or is there a counter proposal? Councillor Robinson, Paul. Sorry, I'm going to have to go with the recommendation. That's a okay, case so you're seconding. Yeah. I, I, I feel for Councillor McCluckery's sentiments, yeah. but it is our strategy, and we can't push um, at times a square plug into a round hole. If something happens in the future, there may be opportunities there, but currently not. So that's a proposal. Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chairman. I. I'm struggling with this one, so I am, and I tell you what the what the main point for me is the potential to create further development, and how accurate is that red line to the to the to the cartilage of the other property? You know, uh, uh, does it leave enough space for potentially another access, or does it not? And that's what's swaying it for me, to be honest. Uh, if it didn't, I would see that as not being a as not being a potential site. But I just don't, you know, the drawing shows it does. It does leave enough access, you know, and uh, that's where I'm having difficulty. I think we could, you know, some of the points that the agent has made, I think there's a very strong argument in what he's saying. But in terms of the the, the chapter there about uh, point H, I'm just not yeah. convincing point H. And I hear about the flood water and all the rest, you know, and uh, uh, I'm just not I think what, what we've got to do is, as a committee, we've got to deal in actualities, what's presented, 
And what's presented at the moment is, and you can see, and we talked about mapping before, there, there is a slight gap there. Um, and you could, uh, in my opinion, at some stage, squeeze another dwelling onto that. And, uh, and uh, another possibility is, and it, it hasn't happened, but something could happen to the ownership of that land in blue and green in the future. We don't know. So the gold postage gained. But at the moment, looking at the details provided by the agent on behalf of the applicant, there is a visual gap. And that's where we have to go on as well. That's material. And that, that's just part of the issues that have to be addressed because there are four issues for refusal. And the agent has said it's a rounding off opportunity, but Darren has quite rightly said it's not a rounding up off opportunity. So look, we have a proposal uh, and that's to go with the officer of recommendation, duly proposed and seconded. Are we all in agreement? Agreed. You're against Councillor Rainey be noted as being against, so it's not, you know, Councillor McCann against as well, Councillor Rushing Gallagher, oh, Divine Gallagher, sorry. <laughs> right, so that's three. Okay, Darren. Okay, members, so uh, application number two, LHN 2023 14140. The recommendation of officers was refused planning permission for the reasons listed in the report and subject to two reasons. Members have refused planning permission uh, for the application and subject to those two reasons. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, members, we'll move on now. Um, we have deferred application number three and application number four. So we go to application number five. That's LA10 bar 2023 bar 1523. And there's a retention of a domestic store and stables for Mr. Armstrong. Darren? Okay, members, so next application in is application number five, LA10 2023-1523. It's a full application by Mr. Armstrong for the retention of a single-story domestic store, sorry, single-story detached domestic store and stables and an extension to the curtilage uh, of 11 Woodbank Road, OMA. The recommendation of officers is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the two reasons. Just take you through the details then, members, uh, on the screen. Uh, and as I say, if there is a slide you wish me to zoom in on, uh, if you just ask, I can try that again. So on the left-hand side of the slide then is the application site. Uh, and you can see the red line is the area around number 11 uh, that has been submitted with the application. On the right-hand side then is the um, red line then annotated onto the flyover map. So you can see number 11, with the uh, access laneway coming in off the road, into the curtilage of the house um, and then the green area at the rear of the property and other buildings in on the right hand side of the property and I'll come on to those in a second. So the agent has submitted supporting information uh, in support of the application and uh, annotated or called these as existing plans. So on the left you can see then the, the uh, map showing number 11, the paddock area around the property and then other buildings and barns to the right hand side. On the right hand side then there's a photograph, an aerial photograph where the agent has annotated onto that a, a number of items. So they are there for ease of reference members. I've typed those on just so you can see those and I'll zoom in again. So you can see number 11, the property of number 11 then at the top uh, annotated as existing dwelling house. You then come around uh, along the edge of the site and there's an existing yard entrance annotated onto the plan. Then an existing tall barn and then an existing single-storey piggery with outside runs has been annotated onto the plan as well. Again, these are some of the photographs provided by the agent in support of the application. Well, this is a Google Street View image. Uh, it's annotated as, as existing entrance to yard. And these are other photographs, again, supplied by the agent in support of the application. And I'm sure he referred to those in his speaking rights. 
So on the left hand side of the, the slide, you can see the buildings, the old buildings that are on the site. Right hand side then again is the entrance in and uh, an existing old building on the site. Again, two more slides, uh, which I'm sure the agent will refer to in more detail. Uh, and that's so some of the buildings on the left and again, buildings on the right. Uh, and then finally, another slide is presented in support of the application, which shows um, a stable building with a horse and uh, in the paddock. So the proposed plans then, members, what we have before us is an application for the retention of a single story detached domestic store and stables and an extension to currently job the dwelling. Number 11 is the applicant's dwelling, and you can see then the location of the building. Again, I've just annotated there a phrase of reference members onto the slide, what's what's um, shown in the plan. So if you start over on the left-hand side of the yellow star, you can see the applicant's dwelling, number 11. You then can write the proposed agricultural fence to enclose the yard, dash with a green line. Then the immediate proposed hedgerow with trees to provide an intermediate enclosure and integration. Then an existing three meter high hedgerow, which will be retained. Then proposed domestic store and stables, and then existing hedgerow retained in three areas along that laneway. Again, I'll come on to that in a second, members, because I know that's quite difficult to read there. So the building then, the domestic store, the detached domestic store that's been applied for is on the screen. The building has been constructed, but uh, what's before you is a slight amendment to that. And the building is 5.6 meters in height or there, thereabouts and is 10.6 meters in width with two roller front uh, shutter doors on the front and also one then on the side and you can see that on the right hand side elevation there proposed floor plans so the two roller shutter doors in the front accessing into the building which is 10.6 meters wide and then uh, on the right hand side you can see the two stables with the tackle Floor area is around 207, 208 square metres uh, in size. And you'll note from the plan members that it says on the drawing at the building, there you can see machinery, a tractor trailer, silage trailer, mower, front end loader, etc. And on the right hand side, it says hay, straw and horse box in this bay. And then over on the right, you have the entrance into the two stable buildings or stable, stable areas. Well, so remember that's a, a photograph then of the existing building and uh, current plans will do propose to amend that by removing the central roller shutter door. So there'll be two roller shutter doors in the front of it. The other roller shutter door then is around the far side uh, facing into the field. Design and need statement is submitted with the application. Uh, and these are two photographs that accompanied the design and needs statement. It states, we attach with this document photographs of the contents of the new building and its intended use. The list of machinery is as follows. A horse trap, bales of hay, horse box trailer, jeep, bikes, go-kart, firewood, mower, land leveler, cattle trailer, silage trailer, slurry tanker, tractor, buck rake, car trailers times three, a log splitter, cement mixer, fertilizer, sewer, sprayer and tools. Uh, and as members, you can see from that photograph, some of the equipment stored in the building. Again, then just referring to the other supporting information provided by the applicant, these are photographs that have been submitted. And these are, I'm sure the agent to say will refer to those. So this is the approach along the Deverney Road, uh, just past the Buddies Playgroup, looking towards the application site. If you come along that road, you can see the applicant's dwelling then is the bungalow on the right hand side. And the uh, detached domestic store and stables building then is further on along to the left hand side of that. As can be seen there as you enter, enter into that roadway. Then as you move along, you come to the front of the applicant's dwelling on the right hand side. And the detached domestic store then is along the laneway. Uh, if you go along the laneway and then look back on yourself, members, that's the view looking back. Sorry, there's a delay here, members. Uh, so the other photograph then is the um, photograph from the Woodbank Road, looking back towards the applicant's dwelling. And you can see the green field there in front of you, the applicant's dwelling then is at the top of that field, and the building is over on the left-hand side. As you move along that road, you're looking towards the application site, you can see the bungalow and then the detached domestic store is over on the left. 
So the agent has also sent in uh, supporting information relating to other buildings in the locality. Uh, and this plan, members, I'll not go into detail on it, but it does show the, the dwellings, other dwellings in the area in green stars. Um, there are other, other businesses in the area, which are the yellow dots. And then there's blue squares, which indicate farm dwellings and associated farm yards. So that um, identifies those businesses in the locality. And that plan then is accompanied by several images which relate to other buildings in the area. So Appendix D on the left, you can see, is a view into number nine from the public road, uh, which the agency says, note the joint construction of the building, tin clad walls, plastic wall, exactly the same as the applicant's shed. Uh, and then the right-hand side, you can see a comment then on two other buildings uh, viewed from the Barrow Road, uh, which uh, the agent considers are similar construction to this application. And then another slide in support of the application from the agent. Uh, it's the view past Buddy's Nursery and into the farmyard. Uh, so members, not often we get an application, I guess, before you. So just to be clear in the, the planning policy that applies. So the new plan strategy obviously is the material consideration for the policy. Within that, alterations and extension policy applies. And development proposals to extend and or alter an existing dwelling will be permitted where the scale, massing and design respect the character of the existing dwelling, neighbourhood property, setting and context. So the policy is accompanied by Appendix 2, which is the guidance for residential extension and alterations. And I've just snipped out there several of the uh, relevant guidance uh, paragraphs within Appendix 2. So 1.12 is material in the countryside ancillary buildings should be designed as part of the overall layout to result in an integrated rural group of buildings. 1.23, through poor design, the individual and cumulative effect of extensions and alterations which are disproportionate in size to existing property or which require the use of land outside the established cartilage of the property will result in a detrimental change to rural character. Uh, and finally then 1.24, Regardless of the physical extent of a site within the countryside, great sensitivity is required to ensure the proposal integrates with the existing dwelling and surrounding landscape. And another issue, members, and just to, to relate back to the planning policy that we have for alterations and extensions, is that uh, 1.24, regardless of the physical extent of a site within the countryside, great sensitivity is required to ensure the proposal integrates with the existing dwelling and surrounding landscape. And the whole idea behind the policy is that the new uh, domestic store or new ancillary building integrates with the existing dwelling. In this case, you can see there's a large gap and a large break between the dwelling and the shed, which is over on the left-hand side, and is physically distanced with a sense of physical separation between the two. So it's clearly not integrated with the existing dwelling. Also then, in relation to the proposal, the application is described as a retention of a single-story detached domestic store and stables. There's no issue really in relation to the stables, but uh, the agent supporting information does uh, provide a list of information uh, on the nature of the materials that will be stored in it. As I say, members, this is described as a detached domestic store, yet you'll note from the design and needs statement, there, in addition to a horse trap, bales of hay, horse box trailer, jeep, bikes, go-kart, firewood, mower, land lever, there's also a cattle trailer, slurry tra silage trailer, a slurry tanker, a tractor, a buck rake, uh, and fertilizer, sore, sprayer, and tools, not commonly found in detached domestic stores and salaries to a, uh, a dwelling in the countryside. The final element then in the report, members will notice is the application is seeking to extend the curtilage of the dwelling. So the curtilage of the dwelling at the moment is identified by the grassed area around the dwelling. It's usually enjoyed for the purposes and salary to the enjoyment of the dwelling house. So there is a fence around the boundary of that property which goes along the yellow line uh, on that slide on the right-hand side. So annotating that onto the, the plan, the proposed plan, then you can see the proposal is to extend the um, site cartilage out from the area in yellow and to go into like an L-shaped bit of land around the area in green where the green star is. And that extends the cartilage of the, the dwelling out. So just annotating that onto there, I'll photograph members. You can see on the slide on the right-hand side, the existing cartilage in yellow, and the proposal then is seeking to extend the cartilage of that dwelling out to include those buildings in the area in green. So that'll leave an area then in between in red, where the grass field of the, the f will extend up in and separate the, the garden of the house uh, and the cartilage of those old buildings.
So, members, for the reasons listed within the report in line with the wording of the transition arrangements in the 2015 Local Development Plan Regulations, when reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the LDP for the reasons stated, and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved contrary to the LDP. To recommend the application is refused for the two reasons listed within the report, which are summarised there on the screen. Thank you, Darren. Uh, members, uh, we have representation from the agent on behalf of the applicant, and the agent again is Mr. David McKinley. David, still back on line? Yes, yes, still here. Yeah, yeah. Right. You have 10 minutes. You good to go? Yes. Oh, uh, yes, yes, I am. Yeah, ready to go. Yes. There you go. Uh, right. Uh, reading through the planning officer's recommendations to the, the committee, uh, I've read into a series, and there's two reasons for refusal. One was the one was the proposal contrary to SP01 deals. So I spent a bit of time on that, and then going back to the summary of the reasons for refusal, slightly different, not much, but we're there. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll make reference to and start off as in policy D03, sustaining rural communities, relating mostly to individual dwellings in the countryside. I don't I don't believe this refusal is sustained or indeed should be a reason for refusal other than it's linked to DE04 and it's mentioned DE4 integration. The reason for this reason for refusal is is completely unjustifiable. We have in my letter to planning service and Darren has a series of photographs from 17 to 18 if I go back to that one very quickly Darren. Uh, given a series of photographs from Google Street View which is current and it has a retained building in its content. Every single photograph I have provided is taken from key points. That's your approach. You can see just above the road sign and behind the trees is a proposed shed. Now you're about 150 metres away from the junction for uh, the access to the dead end road. Uh, every single photograph I provided, and if you continue on through them, Darren, just a wee second, is taken from key points, i.e. approaches to the site from the north, which is this way. You can just about see it, but do you see how well the existing hedgerows, which is owned by the applicant, and the existing buildings actually disguise the building significantly with the tree line to the back. Uh, at the median, uh, the existing road hedge, roadside hedgerows completely integrate the building. As you barely read the building, at the media 90 degree corner, which is that one, uh, that, that image in the road, before you actually access the dead end road, nice in the planning office report, clearly indicates how the existing outbuildings completely dissolve the new building. Like you've, You've lost 60 80 percent of that building with the existing hedgerows and the vegetation is already there. Every single photograph, and you continue on around down, like the red buildings there have completely disguised the building. Uh, as you transient on through, uh, look, it's, you've got the red buildings beside it. Note the tin, the red tin, and the plastered walls, and, and continue on again. Uh, continue on again. You'll that's looking backwards. The gut hedge hasn't been allowed to grow. Uh, and it's, again, it's the owner's, it's the owner's hedge, it's Mr. Armstrong's hedge. He let that go up, and and, and that to me is not, not not uh, not integrated. That that is integration. It's, it's got a form of integration with hedgerows either side of it. So we we have also, you'll notice from the site plan, we have uh, we we've added additional planting proposed, which will enclose the building completely. I feel it doesn't need it, but the applicant, the applicant is willing to plant substantial trees and hedgerows if approved. Note the photographs from the existing farm buildings are clad in tin and roof to, to the roof and the diced walls. We're, we're talking about a, a material here that's not suited to the area. There's um, immediately within a couple of hundred meters. If you look at that one, there's your red tin roof, and we've got we've got we've got we'll even back one there down there. There's it there. Yep, you've got red tin roofs. We've got tin roofs and tin walls. We have that on the existing buildings. That that building's barely visible. Barely visible. Uh, uh, so we have also moved the central roller door to domesticate the building more. Uh, policy HOU of five in our letter of the 29th of August was reviewed the contents of this policy and demonstrated how the immediate area is mixed. For example, we have commercial businesses within 200 metres of this building. We have agricultural farms again within 200 metres of this building. The dwellings within the immediate vicinity of the buildings will not suffer any loss in residential amenity or character. Each and every point was addressed in the HO2, HO5 letter together with additional photographs. And that's what you've been looking at. That's what I presented to the council. The staple that the scale, sorry, the statement that the scale, massing and design respects the character of the existing dwelling relates to a dwelling, not to, to, to an outhouse or domestic store in this case. However, the building has located and probably the best location to integrate and use 
the massing and the siting of the existing remaining buildings to help locate and integrate the building. This building is surely a property gain as opposed to a derelict eyesore. If you go back to the existing photographs, Darren, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, there was reference made uh, there, look, 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 look the existing building. That, that was the existing barn with the double doors. That building's run about six metres tall. Five and a half to six metres tall. Our building's five and a half to six metres tall. It's no no higher. Uh, granted, the, the piggery is behind that one and it shoots over to the tree. You can see the wall of it coming out. Go to the next slide, Darren, if you don't mind. There's, there's the group, and that, that's what we have. And, and, and look at the mess of it. The child was in working at her horse in, in the building with the window and the gable, a small piggery. Uh, it was a, a, it's dilapidated, and actually, health and safety wise, it wasn't fit for purpose. And then a remark go back to the cartilage ones up, uh, Darren, if you don't mind. Uh, it's one we repaired on, but one needs to be noted. But when, the, when the application was in for number 11, 11, and you'll see that on my 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 letter of the 29th of August. The, the red line is what David Porter put in the agent for the site. It's the same as my red line now. The planning officer's recommendation at that stage when I read through the, the planning officer report was that it, it required the outbuildings within the cartilage of the site, required the outbuildings to, to, to allow the integration of number 11 to actually exist in the first place. So, so to say that we're extending the courtly, I think that's interesting. Uh, we had an argument at the start of this application through validation, and I couldn't get away without extending the courtly. I disagree that the courtly is extended because it, the red line was the courtly of the original application. Just so happens there's a small hedge around the side and down the side of number 11, uh, maybe to hide the building slightly, but it's a very, very small hedge, kind of very, very low, low fence. Um, the other one was uh, the extension to Curtilage. That was the big one. So, so I, I, I think to be fair, th th this this replaces this replaces the existing farm buildings that was there. They, they weren't fit for purpose. They were they were dangerous. Uh, Mr. Mr. Armstrong has quite a bit of machinery gathered up. It's a small holding there. It's three horses. The paddock at the back is maintained by. Uh, by his tractor and by his mower. Uh, he has hay making equipment. His uncle, a farmer, just literally 100 metres over the road, has, uh, has an acre of land that he gives him to put hay that he feeds the horses with. So he's almost self self sustained there. Just because there's quite a bit of agricultural machinery there doesn't mean to say it has to be a farmer. He's, he's, he's literally collects and works at, uh, and works at these machines uh, all the time. And in fact, I suppose the, the stables is really for the the daughter and, and the wife enjoys the horses and enjoys riding them around the paddock and, and I've met them actually on the road as well, out like walking the road. So th this this building is fit for what he needs uh, currently. It's We've removed the door uh, in the centre, to be fair, and that was a big point. Uh, he needed direct access into each bay to fulfil all the requirements that he wanted. We've, 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 we've reneged on that and we've moved one door out, so it becomes a wee bit awkward for him to move in and out. So be it. Uh, but I think like I've seen domestic stores approved in the past, uh, not unlike that, perhaps maybe a, a, a slate roof on it, but it's fit for the purpose. It, it retains his machinery, which is an environmental, which has an environmental uh, asset here in that machinery aren't lying around, strewed around a small holding, uh, maybe oil dripping from them, all that sort of stuff. It's all contained now. So there's an environmental benefit here. Uh, and certainly from his own point of view, an economic one, uh, uh, and, and socially, socially, it's, it's, it's his own health and health. Mental health is important, and, and that's what gets the whole family together here. By the way, this was brought to you by a Arvali Residence Association. Now, it was an objector that had concerns that the two immediate neighbours um, had issues with views looking in and out of the site. We have uh, contacted the two neighbours in question, and they have written a letter of support so to me, uh, even all of the, the additional information that we sent in, uh, everybody's had a chance to respond to it, uh, including the objector, and I haven't actually come back since. So to me, to me, uh, to, to me uh, whether it's fictitious or whatever, the, the, the two neighbours, thankfully, has wrote a letter of support, and, and, it's, and that's the two immediate neighbours that, uh, that, um, that's associated to the application that were mentioned originally in the, in, in the, in, in the initial and the initial uh, objection letter. I think I've everything covered here. Um, I'll leave it over to you, Steve.
to put questions to me. Thank Thank you, sir, time and every David. So thank you for rounding up. Right. um, Any questions for David in regard to his representations? Don't see anything. Thank you. We've got now a representation by... Oh, just on the verge, Councillor McLaughlin. Get back in. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the mouse here. I want some cheese. There you go. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, Chair, uh, if the if the if David could uh, convert the size of the shed into uh, into feet for me, please. Uh, Multiply it by uh, it's two. Was it two four by ten point seven six? It's about twenty three hundred square foot. 2,000 square foot. Yeah. I, I was looking more, is it like a 100 by 30 or anything like that there? I mean, generally... It's, it's, the, 10, it's 10 metres. It's, it's 10 metres, so it's a 30-foot 30, 30 span portal. And I believe it's got one, two, three, four bays. Four bays. At, uh, so there you go. It's 30 foot by by 60. 60 by, 60 by 30. Four bay shade, of which yeah. one full bay is taken up with the stables, yeah. So you're basically saying it's a 30 foot ten, four bay shed. Yep, that's it. Yep, 30 yeah, so. four bay shed. So, and feet and feet. How common would those be in the countryside? That that that, from an agricultural point of view, is probably the most common agricultural shade that you can get. Uh, usually, the four bay uh, four machinery uh, is 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 exactly right, and there's nearly always two roller doors in now. I'll, I'll be brutally honest. So yes, that that is a very common agricultural shield. Okay, so if you indulge me one bit further, um, your client isn't a farmer, but he keeps three horses on on land. Is that is that what you're saying? He he, he doesn't. Yes, that's right. Yes. yes. As far as deer is concerned, he's not a farmer. No. But no. He, no, he, no. He, he has a small holding and carries out operations. Yes. Do you three horses? I said he has a. He takes three acres. He helps his uncle out, which is just over the road a little bit as well. Uh, summertime, sort of spring, summertime, and, and autumn, bringing in helping him with crops and bits and pieces. He's literally just over the road behind Buddy's playgroup. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Okay. Any further questions? No more questions for David. Thank you very much, David. Um, Right. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, could you draw forward? That's it there. Thanks, Tom. Procedure is um, five minutes to present your representation and no more. There'll be no questions. You're just basically making your representation on behalf of the applicant. Are you good to go? Could you pull the, the mic down, Tom? That's it, yep. If you are good to go, I'll just get you. There you are. If okay, I thank you, Chairman and members of committee for the opportunity to come and to address committee today on this particular application. The agent has very well set out the uh, scene for us, but here we have a replacement for an existing group of shades. Uh, a replacement that you have seen uh, on the screen today is on usable, is on safe, is dilapidated, is uh, far from being environmental friendly, and it's uh, no longer suited for the purpose that it was built years ago. And I think we'll all agree that it's long past what it was originally erected for and of no use to the applicant in such a condition. It's dangerous. The one has tossed a part of it that was unsafe. And um, therefore, uh, the applicant then went and built this new uh, shade on it. I note the reasons for refusal uh, by planning, DEO3, DEO4, and housing uh, HOU5. And what we need to do is satisfy ourselves as to whether their criteria set out uh, by planning has been met or not met. So let's look at the evidence. This is a rural area which the proposal is situated within an area of a, a, a mixture of farming groups and individual businesses. And this is a the development that fits in with uh, what already exists 
within this particular area. It's not something that, that is as a sore thumb, if you like, outside of what already exists within the area. And if we look at the, some of the issues that set out in the criteria, uh, we can ask ourselves, does it retain and enhance the positive aspects of the character and appearance of the surrounding area? And I think as we look at what we saw today, it certainly enhances that the area, the appearance of the surrounding area, uh, and um, as a development that's located uh, right the character and the appearance of the surrounding area doesn't um, step outside of that. Does then the building um, result in the unacceptable damage to the local character, environmental quality, or residential amenity of the established residential area? And again, I think when we look at it, there is no loss of environmental quality or residential amenity, there is no emissions from the building as something that fits well again within the area. And again, uh, there was the issue raised with regards to planting and the hedgerows around it. And we know that uh, additional planting has been added to future or to plans that has gone in. So there's going to be additional, additional planting around it as well. And we look at the issue of integration, something that again was raised as a concern. And I think if you look at all the photographs that were provided uh, from all the different viewpoints, it is clear, folk, that this, uh, this uh, development or this proposal it's not standing out. It's not seen as something that's standing out in the skyline. It fits in. Uh, it fits in with the area. It fits in a lot better than some of the development that is within the area. And it's much more secluded than um, a lot of these uh, other buildings there. And therefore, it is something I believe that is an enhancement to the rural area, as an enhancement to that particular um area, that particular rural area, when you look at what was there and what is in place now. And I think that um, in the whole issue of health and safety, the whole issue of um, uh, visual amenity and so forth, that this is something that um, fits into there. I believe it meets the policy. I believe it addresses the, uh, the concern that's set out by uh, planning. And I would say to the committee to give deep consideration to the uh, approval of this particular application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed. If you could dress back. Thank you. Uh, Darren, back to you. Yeah, members, I think the, the report really does cover all the issues that have been raised today in the, in the speaking rights. Um, I just want to confirm really some of the comments made, and I would agree with the agent that there was old buildings there uh, that have been tossed. They were un unsafe, so they've been tossed and replaced with a new building. But just to point out and remind members that those were old agricultural buildings or, you know, they weren't domestic in nature or scale. They were um, tossed and the new grey cladded shed was built. They're now seeking to retain that shed as a detached domestic store. The evidence being presented to you today, uh, all as planning officers have shown, the agent has confirmed, there's a lot of agricultural equipment in there. It's very difficult to, 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 to put the two stories together that this domestic store is needed to store agricultural equipment. If it's an agricultural building they wanted, they should have applied for an agricultural building. This is a domestic store. It's not an agricultural building. The agent even said himself, the building is the most common agricultural shed you find. So it even looks like an agricultural building. You know, um, so if we can maybe focus on that and make sure that in any consideration and discussion today, it's as a domestic store. It's not as an agricultural building. That is a different application. If this application is approved, I'll be honest, members, there's likely to be enforcement action following up for a change of use from a domestic store to an agricultural building. So it's really going to be of no assistance to this, members. And, and uh, I'll be honest, from a planning officer's perspective, if they wanted an agricultural shed and applied for it, officers will, will work with them and try and assist them where we can. But what's before you is not that. It's a detached domestic store and stables. So just to bear that in mind, members. I think, members, you may want to give consideration to what Darren has said. In actual fact, what the agent has said in his representation in regard to the description of uh, and the detail with regard to the application. That's all I'll say. Councillor McCann. 
you, Chairman. Uh, Darren, what, which one of these recommendations does it actually highlight the issue that you've just spoken on in terms of the domestic and agriculture? So planning policy, this is a, this is a case of the description. Yeah. Well, if you, uh, the applicant today has not come along saying, I need this detached domestic store and listing you a long list of, the, of domestic things to store in this building. They're giving you a list of things that will be stored in the building and a huge percentage, a large percentage of them are not domestic. They're agricultural. So it's to bear that in mind, members, that you know this may be applied for a domestic store, but it looks like an agricultural building. It'll store agricultural equipment largely. So it's not a domestic store ancillary to the dwelling. It's physically separated from it. There's a large gap between the two. You know, so there's a lot of issues going on here that really are there's planning policies, yes, but there's also issues, I think, and the approach in this application, from my perspective, is if they were to retain this building for an agricultural purposes, applying as a domestic store has been the wrong avenue and the wrong approach to it, members. Okay, Councillor McKenna. For now, Chair, yeah. Uh, that's okay. Councillor Thompson, I'm letting you in because you're going to say something, I think. Yeah, th thank you very much, Chair. Uh, apologies for being able to... Oh, no, you were noted at the start. It's only over. But uh, I know, uh, because I arrived in, during the application, that I'm not allowed to speak on the matter. Okay, that's clarified. Apologies again, Chair. No, no, there's no, no apologies, Earl. I already noted uh, the reasons behind and said you might drop in. Councillor okay. McClockery, John. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the agent has clearly said that the applicant isn't a farmer. Uh, and as a general, how do we standardise? Is is it through the DRA business number that that we we designate that someone's a farmer? Members, the, the application says not for an agricultural building. Those issues would be relevant if it was an application for an agricultural building. What's before you is as a store, so there's no need in this case in this application for this applicant to be a farmer. Now, if there was an application in for a replacement store or a replacement agricultural building, you don't need to have a day area business number. Uh, you can come along and say, I have some agricultural equipment that my uncle owns and I wish to keep it in my land and help out and maintain my land. You build up a picture to demonstrate why you would need an agricultural building. But say that's not what's before you today. It's a domestic store. Thank you, Darnell. Put more thought into it. Okay, Councillor O'Reilly, Tom. Just as a matter of interest, Darren, um, what what uh, gives us the power to say what I should have in my domestic store? I, I surely uh, that is not the the remit of planning uh, sort of uh, um, committee to uh, say what I should store. I could. Stored a space shuttle in my domestic store if I if I so desired, you know. Uh, well, why are we getting into what the content of the store is? Uh, because once we get into that content, then we're then angling towards it points towards this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. It could be if I store my light plane in it, it could be a, a hanger. Yeah. Uh, so the description of a proposal is very very important in relation to a planning application. And one of the most important reasons is that the neighbours then know what you've applied for. So if you apply for a domestic store, any reasonable person looking at that will say, oh, that'll be domestic stuff that you keep every day in your garage. If I go back to the photograph yeah. of that building, that description wouldn't relate to what the nature of that building is being used as. So the neighbours will come along and say, hang on, those things aren't domestic. That's not what the application was for. So that's why I'm saying, members, the, the, the application here is a domestic store. We have to consider it against the planning policy and the planning strategy. I'll just go back to it. So the policy is the scale, massing, and design respects the character of the existing dwelling. And then you've got all the guidance going with that. Those are the policy tests that you have to look at. So does that building, is the scale, massing, and design respect the character of the existing dwelling? For the reasons that set out in the report, we would say no. It's got great cladding on it. It's a large building that looks like an agricultural shed. It's physically distant from the building. It's separated by it by the gap. You can see it clearly there. Uh, it may be beside other buildings, but those other buildings have red roofs on them. They're small domestic or small and sort of typical 
vernacular rural agriculture buildings, you know, this thing does not blend naturally with those. So it's the application of the domestic store we're in for today. But what I'm saying to you and also the agent and applicant is that if it's an application for an agricultural shed before the planning office and the council, that's a different policy context and one that we will work with the applicant and agent on that. And Chair, if you allow me to go on just as curiosity, uh, was the photograph supplied uh, early on with the application or were the photographs only supplied for the actual um, presentation here? This? So it's been part of the application as it's been going through. Okay, so the photographs have been with the application from day one. Uh, why was the application proceeded with uh, uh, if it's you know on a on a on a fair um, in your view yep. uh, domestic uh, against a, uh, an agricultural chain? So in terms of the validity of the application, it meets the legislative test to be a valid application. What we have is the supporting background information, which is presenting a case. That case seems to conflict with what I would call a detached domestic store. He's making the argument that those those items will be stored in it and it will be a detached domestic store. Now, no, no, and I fully accept that, Chair. What I'm trying to get at is why has it came... I, what I'm interested at here is why applications get to committee at all. And what I'm interested in this case is why, why when the evidence is there, so it wasn't that the agent built the evidence announced to you, uh, the evidence was clearly there, so why wasn't it a case pointed out? If you wish to proceed with this, the evidence you are presenting here, either change your evidence or change your application to uh, an agriculture. There was discussions about that, and the application has proceeded because the applicant hasn't withdrawn it, and that's, just, that's, that's a, the answer. That's okay. another point. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. I think we'll bring um, Philip in for just clarity with regard to uh, aspects of the law. Philip? Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, uh, again, members, it's just to refer members back to um, the uh, case which I've previously referred members to in relation to uh, the, an application brought by Mr. Gordon Duff and Causeway Coast and Glens uh, Borough Council where the um, judge, Mr. Justice Schofield, indicated that there were certain matters um, which lay within the remit of reasonable planning judgment, but that reasonable planning judgment effectively could only be stretched so far. Um, and the expression, members, if you remember, we we raised this in the in the training was that you know planning didn't exist in the world of Humpty Dumpty. Um, so um, th that's where it becomes important from Darren's point of view uh, when we're looking at the description of it. If it is described as a domestic store, there's only so far we could stretch that um, description. Um, um, uh, that, um, you know, if we want to be in a position whereby we can reasonably defend uh, any decision which is made by this council in the event that a challenge was to be brought in the Judicial Review Court, I have no idea how realistic a challenge would be in this particular case, members, but it would be remiss of me not to flag it up as an issue. Thanks very much for that, Philip. Um, Councillor McCann, Stephen. Thank you, Chair. I'm just digesting what Philip has just said as well. Uh, Chairman, see in terms of the two recommendations for refusing in front of us, uh, and listening to the presentation from the planning officers and the agent as well, I'm satisfied that the agent has addressed the two reasons for recommendations for refusal, in terms which both of which are in terms of integration and how this building blends into the countryside. I seen the photographs presented on the screen, and I didn't see one offensive photograph which would say to me this building is out of context of the area. And indeed, when you look at the wider area. You can see the number of uh, of uh, similar buildings and businesses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which are in that immediate vicinity. So, in my opinion, the recommendations presented to us for refusal one and two, I can safely stand over them by going against them recommendations. However, that doesn't. I can comment on the domestic as well, but where does this stand in terms of one and two, which I've just addressed? I'm happy to propose going contrary to the re to the recommendations of, refu of refusal, based on what I've just said. Um, I'll ask Darren to comment. So members say the application is described as a detached domestic store and stables. The report gives you an assessment against the policy with the recommendation and the reason for refusal. 
if you wish to go contrary to the officer's recommendation and approve the application and give it a reason why you think you should go to the contrary to the officer's recommendation, that's up to you. But what I'm saying to you members is just to be very, very clear that the application that's before you and the supporting information and all of that evidence relates to a large percentage of agricultural equipment um, and the domestic store element really is limited in its uh, its content. Um, so I just urge caution to, to members, you know, if you are going to approve this as a domestic store, it's in the full knowledge it is a domestic store you're approving, not an agricultural building. Chairman, I want to go ahead and make my proposal. Uh, I think I've addressed the reasons one and two I was before for refusal, and I'm willing to go against the recommendations of the officers and propose we do the grant approval. Again, based on the integration, uh, I believe that the photographs presented and the commentary from the agent and indeed the, the gentleman who spoke on behalf of the applicant as well has, has addressed the concerns of integration. The photographs, I believe, is that the shed clearly integrates. There's a high tree line in the background. There is a substantial head rosy approach. It's similar to height to the tall barn. You know, I haven't seen a photograph that would uh, show this building as being offensive. So uh, I'm happy to propose uh, going contrary to the recommendations of refusal. Uh, I believe I've addressed recommendation one, or sorry, reason one and reason two. Thank you. Councillor Robinson, Paul. Yes, I'm going to repeat what Councillor McCann said, but I'm happy enough to second it. Okay, do I have any further contrary proposals? Comment from the chair uh, to be taken on board by the proposing seconder. The other buildings in the district are of a different colour. This is actually grey, light grey. Um, the existing agricultural buildings are red. The wood um, kitchen manufacturer is light green, which is more integrated. There was mentioned by the agent as well that the adjoining uh, boundary hedge has been kept trimmed, but it could actually be let to grow up and provide natural cover uh, existing there. Maybe something that you may wish to consider in uh, putting forward to the planning officer with regard to conditioning. If there's no further proposal, uh, Councillor Rainey, sorry. I, uh, sorry, Chair. Yeah, go I ahead. really wanted to support the, the proposal and the seconder. And uh, as for the machinery, I think that he needs to find another home for the machinery and certainly with his father or father-in-law up, up the road, that's, that's going to be no problem. Councillor Robinson. I think more integrated. We could let that hedge could let grow up and that then put a condition that the hedge is allowed to grow. Okay. Uh, members, you've got a proposal for Olivia. Are we all agreed? You know, no. Fair enough. Um, all agreed, apart from Councillor McGuire. Darren? Okay, members. So, application number five, then, LA 10 2023 the full application. The recommendation of officers was to refuse planning permission. The reasons listed in the report were subject to two reasons. Members have uh, gone contrary to the officer's recommendation and have granted planning approval for the uh, application. In relation to conditions, members, um, if I again could just ask for part of attach conditions is delegated back to, to officers. There would be two standard conditions just in relation to the planting that is proposed to be carried out and retention of existing boundaries and then also roads issues in terms of the provision of the uh, visible displays at the access. Okay, um, a proposal and second are happy with those. Uh, yep, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll take a proposal for a comfort break. Proposed Councillor Robinson, second Councillor McClockwright. You have 10 minutes. You'd, if you just back in before uh, between 10 to and quarter to um, five, please. Thank you. You turn the recording on.
before we go I might as well, as well hop, hop on, on here. here. We'll go on now to item, item five, six, six, and that's for LA 10 bar 2022 bar 1062. Um, dwelling, um, outline for a dwelling with attached domestic garage for P. McDonald. Uh, Aaron. Okay, okay so application number six then, uh, LA 10, 2022, 1062. An outline application by Mr. McDonald for a dwelling with detached domestic garage, and the location then is 50 metres west of 244 Clabby Road from Core Temple. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report, and subject to three reasons. Uh, members will recall that the application was presented to the committee at the meeting in February of 23 with a recommendation to refuse. There is deferred delegated back to officers to consider other policies within PPS 21. These have been explored, but no suitable alternatives have been identified or agreed. And the application was returned as a refusal on the weak list and subsequently called in uh, and is now presented for determination. We'll run through some of the uh, maps and drawings in, members. So um, the application site is identified on the screen. You can see it beside the red star there. On the other side of the site, you have three properties. So 250 is over on the left hand side and 244 and 240 on the right hand side. I'll come on to those more detail. There is a supporting drawing from the agent and that's uh, included on the screen so you can see the red line, red stars beside the proposed site and then you have the other buildings. Um, let me just zoom in a bit. Um, on that plan the uh, agent has included the frontages so if you start over on the left, the frontage number 250 has the 78 metre frontage. You then move along the Clabby Road and you have the proposed site. You then have number 244, which is a 32 metre frontage. And then over to number 240, which is an 82 metre frontage. So it gives you an idea of the buildings that are surrounding the site. Um, so just to take more detail on that, so the site then uh, superimposed or tried to draw on as best they can the red line of the application site onto this image. And you can see that it takes up the uh, field to the left of number 244. So along the stretch of the Clabby Road you have number 240, number 244 and 250 with our site in between 244 and 250. So that looks on an aerial image, so you can see 240 on the right hand side, 244 then our application site, then a green field, and then over to number 250 on the left hand side. So 240, so just go back remember, so you can see over on the right number 240, the house set in off the road with the, the driveway running up to it. So that's number 240. And we move along the road then to the right hand side towards the large corner for trees there. You can see over on the right, and this is trees. Um, so this is the entrance um, into the adjacent property. You just, just see it there, there. amongst the trees, the trees number 244, accessed up that uh, private lane or private entrance up into the property. So, so keeping moving, moving right then is the application site, which is identified with the yellow star, and that's the road frontage part of that field. So, so if you just, um, on that photograph there, there members, if you just go up slightly and then turn around and look back at yourself, that's the view back towards the, the trees and things around that property. There is a large, um, there are two large walls there, remember, which uh, said one time were a building or a shed or some means of enclosure or used for storage or something. Um, that's the Google Street view, just looking into it. So you can see really all that remains of that is the two side walls. There's no rear or front wall on that. So that wouldn't be considered to be a building within the, the, the definition of the meaning of the policy. Our site then is the right hand side of that. And as you can see, so again, just moving to the right hand side, uh, the green field, you can see that's the view then across the adjacent field up towards number 250. And then some more images as you move along towards number 250. And that's the entrance in then into that property. So, so turn around then and looking back on yourself down the road towards our application site, which is just the other side of that hedge. As you can see it down the of the red arrow. So in terms of the application members, the uh, 
the uh, policies and new plan strategy apply. One of those policies is as an infill opportunity on HV13. You can see the application site is roughly 40 metres in width, and the adjacent field then is around 60 metres in width. So again, uh, the red rectangles are roughly 20 metres in length, which would be the typical length of a bungalow, or maybe a bungalow is slightly longer, but 20 metres is a good, good starting point. So you can see our application site then is the yellow star. You then have the field to the left of the application site, um, where there's room again for two uh, rectangular shaped bungalow sized buildings. And then there's also an area in front of the existing house on the left hand side. There's a paddock there, an area there where there'd be room for a fourth dwelling. So that's that area there. Uh, the agent, uh, the applicant has made a case that that site's not suitable for a dwelling due to its size, the constraints of the site. They also the uh, impact of the neighbouring buildings, etc., and the fact that the applicant or the owner sorry, of that site would not be willing ever to develop a house in there. Um, however, there's nothing really that would preclude the development of a new dwelling in there if it met the planning policies. It's wide enough to put a house in, there's room to put a garden area and access and uh, amenity space, etc. Um, and really, if the applicant wishes to apply for a house, it would have to be considered on its merits. So members, the, the application is considered not to be an infill uh, site as there's room for more than two dwellings in the gap between the buildings, 244 and 250. Uh, also, it's not a rounding off opportunity um, for a number of reasons, but I think the application has been applied for as, a, as an infill opportunity. Um, so, so the reason listed within the report in line with the wording of transition arrangements in the 2015 LDP regulations and reading both the DDP and the plan strategy together, the proposal does not accord with the LDP for the reasons stated, and there are no other material considerations to indicate that it should be approved according to the local development plan. So it's recommended for refusal, and there's really three issue, two issues, members. It's not a rounding off opportunity, and it's not an infill opportunity. It's an important visual break. There is a reason for refusal in relation to a farm business, uh, as uh, the expiration of alternative opportunities uh, did identify that the applicant was a farmer and has a farm business. However, there has been a previous approval for a farm house using that farm business ID number, uh, where they've used their 1 in 10, so uh, it wouldn't apply. But I think the applicant is making the case today that it's an infill opportunity. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have a representation from the applicant, Mr. Paul McDonald, by Webex. Paul, are you connected? I am, yeah. Right, and I can see you. That's okay. I'm going to maybe just turn this off again just so I can hear you better then, if that's okay. That's okay. Um, the procedure is, uh, when you're ready to go, I'll say present, and you have 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes, um, after which the committee may or may not ask you questions. If we don't ask you questions or we exhaust our questions, we'll go on. You have no further opportunity to come back in to uh, make comment or anything that we further discuss. Do you understand? I do. Right. Are you ready to go? I am. Right, well, there you go, you have four. 10 minutes up to. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. And just on behalf of my agent, Eugene Hoy, I would make, like to make an apology as to why he couldn't attend today due to his ongoing illness, and just he was unable to attend today, hence why I'm here by myself. So, firstly, I would like to address my initial application for an infill dwelling on the site, which was subsequently recommended for refusal by the planning department. And I consider that, again, this should qualify as an infill due to the substantial supporting information I have since applied. And I would also like to draw your attention to the similarities in terms of layout and the relationship to other buildings, which the planning committee found acceptable for approval at the last month's meeting between 65 and 67 of the Scan Road, Irvinstown. I then would like to come on to address the issues around our farm business ID. And for the avoidance of doubt, I would point out that our farm business is managed by myself, my brother and both my parents. We are all actively involved in the maintenance and upkeep of the farm. It is a family-run farm enterprise and always has been. So some of the land identified on the farm maps, which were submitted in support of my application, belong to me. Some of it belongs to my brother and parents, and the remainder of the lands are leased in Conacher, as is permissible within this policy. Whilst the lands are owned separately, they all fall within the one farm business ID and are managed by us all together. My brother and I are both recently married, 
and, and I've been fortunate, fortunate enough to start our own families. I live, I live on the home farm, farm and, and in our family home at 26 Pool Cran Road, Tambo. My, my brother lives on the farm as well and renovated an old dwelling in Carn Tambo. In order to do so, my parents moved out of our family home before I got married and are living in a modular home, also in Carn. And this again is located on the farm. The modular building was subject of planning approval LA 10, 2018 1266. And that building was approved as a farm dwelling in November 18. It was never my intention to live in our family home for long, and as my own family expands, I would like to be able to build my own home on the farm. The family home where I currently reside is located in close proximity to our farm buildings, which are located to the immediate east, as well as an accompanying field of approximately one hectare, which is also to the east. This field is the only piece of ground that I personally own on this part of the farm. The other the only other area of the farm which is under my ownership is the land upon which the subject planning application is located. So whilst I accept that policy HOU 11 restricts farm businesses to one grant of planning permission for a farm growing every 10 years, I firmly assert that the circumstances in this case are both unique and compelling. The previous dwelling was approved on the applicable policy at the time, namely PPAS 21 and policy CTY 10. That dwelling, which is a modular type building, acts as a retirement dwelling for my parents, which provides them with an opportunity for them to be close to my brother and I while still remaining on our farm. What I am proposing in this application is really a family home for my own family at a location which will best allow me to oversee the day-to-day -day activities which is associated with running a farm business. Activities that some of the members will be well aware of from their own farming background. With this in mind, and to prove my commitment to this project, I would be content for any forthcoming permission to include a condition which limits or restricts the occupation of the dwelling to me or my family. Another issue which was raised in the professional planner's report concerning policy HOU 11 included the siting of proposed dwelling away from an established group of buildings on the farm. As members will be aware, there is provision within HOU 11 to allow for a dwelling on the farm to be sighted away from the established farm groupings where the farm activities would significantly affect the amenity of the new dwelling or where there are verifiable plans to expand the farm and there are no alternative sites at another site on the farm. The principal group of buildings on our farm are located on the western side of the dwelling house where I currently reside. These buildings currently comprise of a slatted house and an, adjo an adjoined loose house. The land within my ownership includes the one hectare field which surrounds these buildings. The closest land that I own outside of this land and within the farm business is located on the site of the proposed development. This field, which is beside my house where I currently reside, plays an important role in the functioning of the farm. It provides for extensive grazing and cutting. And I would also note that based on our current farming practices, it is highly likely that in years to come it will be needed for an to expand the farm, build, farm buildings at this location, thus reducing that one field by a significant margin, and it's not already a big field to start with. There are other issues with the location of the existing farm buildings in Poolcran. The access to the site is via a shared EMI. This provides difficulty for us as it is, domestically in terms of accessing our current dwelling, but also in relation to the farm. The access is in poor condition, and to intensify the existing access by adding another dwelling at this location would add to an existing problem faced by ourselves and our neighbours. This is particularly the case when considered in line with forthcoming plans to expand, to expand the existing farm buildings. Furthermore, from an amenity perspective, our existing dwelling is in close proximity to the existing buildings, and depending on the time of the year and the nature of activities on the farm, this can create periods of excessive noise and odour. It is to be expected at this location, so close to our farm buildings, but it is something I never would have intended within the long term. With all of this in mind, I feel that we have a reasonable case for a farm dwelling located in the closest possible position to our existing farm buildings and on a site which visually integrates into this rural landscape. To conclude and to directly correlate the points I have raised to the reasons for refusal contained at refusal number three in the planner's report, I have shown that farm business has verifiable plans to expand at our home farm in Kulkran, 
and I had that restricts the area within my ownership that I could potentially use to build a farm dwelling at that location. I have also referred to the existing access issues which myself and my neighbours currently have faced and how a new dwelling would exacerbate that problem. I have also explained how the proposed site is located at the closest possible position within my ownership and to the farm grouping and highlighted the specific intricacies associated with the previously approved building on our farm. Again, with all of this in mind, I feel that a farm dwelling can be approved at this location without significantly offending the policy contained within the Manahoma Area Plan, the Plan Strategy specifically, Policy HOU 11. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, members, any, any questions? questions? You've got away, away likely, Paul. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Oh, oh sorry. Councillor Campbell, Campbell just squeezed in towards the end. Len. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the representation. I suppose maybe a, a question for our officers as much as for the applicant, but um, uh, the applicant has mentioned you know, reason the wilderness you, that his agent cannot be here uh, to make representation. Was there any contact made with their officers in relation to that, or any? It's just unfortunate, you know, and, and uh, wish the agent well, but it's unfortunate that we don't have both the agent and the applicant here. I would say. Yeah, no, but it has been deferred from a previous meeting, so. And there's been no request for. Yeah. yeah. No. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for much, Glenn. Any further, further questions, questions or comments? comments? Who? Um, Darren? Uh, Members, so the, the application in the case being presented here is that this should be permitted under h 2 11 as a dwelling in the farm business. There's a lot of information there in relation to the uh, site of the, the new dwelling. However, the principle of the, the dwelling uh, under h 2 11 a new house is approved in the farm business once every 10 years. Uh, and as the applicant has confirmed, there has been an approval under that farm business for a farm dwelling. It might have been under PPS 21, uh, and we're now working on the plan strategy, but that 10 years still applies. So the principle of a dwelling here has already been granted as is 1 in 10, uh, and unfortunately there may be a split within that business of a number of people, but it's the one business. So regrettably, members, uh, the, the applicants and the farm business already has been permitted a dwelling under HUE 11 as a dwelling in the farm business. Thank you very much, Darren. Members, any questions for Darren? No. Then, sorry. Answer Robinson, Paul. So you're saying, Darren, in the 10 years and I'm not a lot? Say that other site you said about the roof in the group there, and the only walls and that. Does that mean that, does that take into account that we won't go in the middle there? The only wall that Toronto managed just because there's walls, or does it need to be a roof on it as well? The respect of the, 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 the information on the walls really was to inform you members to make sure you're fully informed of what that is on the ground. It's not a building, it's, it's two walls. That is, that's, that's, that's relevant then. Yeah, it's relevant then when you get into the planning policies if you're starting to get into discussions about, uh, you know, infill and grouping with existing buildings and things like that there. It's, it's all relevant to that. However, say, the principle of this on the HU 11, the fact that there's been one in 10, all of those discussions really aren't really that relevant because we've already granted approval for a dwelling on a farm. Thank you. Okay, Councillor, thank you. Any further, further questions? questions? We need a proposal, members.
Councillor McLaughlin, John. Sorry, um, who's it? It's uh, the, 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 the farm dwelling, obviously, that, that's 10 years. That there's, there's no, the, the modular building, it cannot be, can he, can he apply to, is there any way to change that, that application or dwelling that be, you know, closer to the farm? I know he's given reasons why not, but is there any, any, is that, is that something that, that is set in stone or is, it, is, is that, is that the application that's, that's causing the problem? The, uh, the approval, the, it's the 2018 approval, uh, 1266. So that's granted the 10 years starts from that date. So 10 years from the, you know, the, the That's already, Tom. Yeah, just as a curiosity again, uh, I thought there was uh, cases where uh, in the past we had relinquishing of one site uh, against another site. Just explain that to me then, in the context. Yeah, so uh, if you have an approval and say you don't want to build there, you want to build it somewhere else, you swap the approval one for one, that can be done. And there's no issue there. there. The difficulty here is that that previous approval for uh, the house and the farm was to retain something. So if you take that permission away, then that will be good. Yeah. 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 Councillor McGuire, Tommy. I go on to the early thing. Chair, just, just a question in relation to the agent. Uh, uh, I believe we did defer because the agent wasn't well previously. I'm just wondering, was there any engagement with the agent with yourselves, Darren, uh, earlier on in this application? Because there, there's... there's Councillor Riley, Tom. Uh, Chair, in light of all of the uh, uh, discussion here and, and the tenure really is the key in this, uh, I'm going to propose that we go with the officer's recommendation. Okay, unfortunate. Um, I've got a proposal to go with this officer's recommendation to refuse. I think we can't overcome the hurdle 10 years. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Devine Gallagher, thank you. Any counter proposals? No. Right, we'll go. Councillor Feely, you just got in there on time, Anthony. Th th no, thanks, Chair. It's just not part of the AFL leave now, so, so you can't say that. Uh, well, we're, we're just, just about, about to take a vote. So oh, yeah, yeah, after that, I'll leave. That's okay. That's all right. Right, are we all in favour?
I know, I know, I, I appreciate that. That is not the way to put it, but we, we, are, we are constrained, right? That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll move on now to item six, and that's to note the schedule of planning decisions issued in September. Any questions? A bit of a proposed and seconder, proposed Council Maguire, second Councillor Thompson. That's noted. Item seven to note update report on planning appeals in September. Paul, do you want to just say something quicker on that before we note? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, you'll you'll see the detail within the report. It's two planning appeals that were uh, determined recently, uh, and just to note, probably the first two under our new plan strategy. Um, both were dismissed by the Commissioner, agreed fully with uh, the recommendations and the decision of the, of the Council, and I suppose maybe um, we're all holding them and bitting our breath to see would, was there any sort of commentary from the Commissioner on the wording of the policies or anything like that, but there was nothing negative, so um, all positive. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Did a proposer propose Councillor Robinson, second Councillor McGuire, I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're going to item 8, and that's to note the report on uh, PAN's proposal of application notice. Opposed, Councillor Thompson for noting. Second, Councillor Rainey. Thank you. We're going to item 9, and that is to note the report on planning committee actions from January through to June of this year. If no questions, can we propose to note Councillor Robinson and Councillor Rainey? Thank you. And we'll go on to consider report in relation to the review of the planning regulations. Paul, I think you want to take that item to him. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, members, this is um, again a, a part of the regional improvement work that's going on at the minute in response to the NIO and PAC reports, and you're probably well familiar with those now at this stage. And one of the elements in relation to the local development plan then is a review of the LDP regulations, as we would call them. Um, so, so, members, you'll see the, the sort of specific quick questions that we've been asked um, to feed back into, and they relate to you know, five specific areas in relation to the consultation bodies, uh, the commencement and duration of consultation. Than it had been anticipated, and and you know we need legislative change to, to address that and potentially moving the one plan document rather than two two uh, two documents. Um, I think, I think we're, we're promoting a review of the consultation bodies during the plan process. We had a number of consultation bodies coming to us and saying, "Look, why are you sending this letters? Um, we don't have any infrastructure in Northern Ireland. We're not interested in Northern Ireland." Um, I know one council, in terms of the consultation periods, had missed the, the, the period by one day and had to retake a consultation, so clarity in terms of the consultation periods would be helpful. Um, and then just reducing the burden in terms of consultation and notification and advertisements of the minor stages, where members of the public can't get involved, you know, when we notify the PA, uh, the department, um, and notify the public just of the AE taking place. Um, and then there's also provisions of hard copies in the legislation, both to the PAC and the department. And I know we, we were at particular expense. I think we sent a poll to the department of hard copy files and a poll to the PAC as well. And they also got PDFs. So it's a requirement of legislation, but I think it's a, that, that's not for, for purpose anymore. And it's a, it's a burden on us. So if we can move the PDFs. So I think just to note, members, then the next steps is uh, once we feed back, there will be a formal consultation and any amendments to the legislation. We'll feed into that again. So thanks, Chair. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Are, Are we, we happy, happy to approve the draft, draft comments as attached? Could have a proposer, Councillor McGuire and Councillor Robinson. Thank you very much indeed.
or if you want, sorry. Yes, so the report just then on the improvement programme. Members will recall then the workshop that we had on the 27th of September um, a couple of weeks ago, and we had some good, um, I think, positive and constructive discussions at, at that um, as part of looking at our, our, our programme for improvement. So members agree to that, the options that they wish to take forward, um, and those are actually attached as Appendix um, 1 within this paper. So there was 19 options agreed, uh, there was two discounted, and there was five identified as required. Um, further work. So, so the, the, the detail of those is laid out in Appendix 1 and it also includes then the detail on prioritisation and the next steps associated with each of those. Um, so it's just to, to, to bear that in mind. I suppose just in terms of um, as we approach the, the estimate season, I know that members would all be aware um, of the constrained financial um, situation that the Council um, is actually is actually in and would just basically urge a note of caution and ensuring um, that all areas can be resourced. So while we are agreeing an overall improvement program we may need to come back to you at some stage in the future if we're not able to progress uh, particular aspects of that but we will keep you fully fully informed as we are aware ourselves but in terms of particularly some of the short um programs and the, and the quick wins as it were we will proceed um with your approval today to, to start implementing them in essence immediately are we happy enough members any questions could I have a proposal seconder to note and progress the initiatives? Councillor Robinson, thank you. Councillor McGuire, did I see your hand going up? Yeah, well done, thank you. Did you know? <laughs> I was just a bit late, but I happened to see it sort of going up. Thank you. Uh, correspondence item 12. First one from the um, Ombudsman's office. Yes, the first one is from the Ombuds, um, um, Ombudsman's office. It's getting too late in the day to be saying that one very fast. Um, so this is the initial results from an own initiative investigation um, that was taken out by the Ombudsman to look into how public bodies effectively promote, administer and enforce the statutory protection um, of trees. Um, and I think you, you will recall there, there was a, a template circulated to all the councils and considerable information was, was, was requested at that stage. So having considered all this information, the Ombudsman has chosen not to proceed with a full investigation investigation. Um, however, she has had significant observations and recommendations in the attached report. Um, the overview report is called Tree Protection Strengthening Our Roots. So coming out of that, there are 26 recommendations, 16 of which are for councils with an additional two uh, joint um, recommendations between the department and councils. So while we are currently responding on the factual accuracy of, of that report, um, we will bring back a full report when it is finalised and also the implications then um, of those um, additional um, recommendations that are coming um, for, for, for councils to, to see what uh, we need to, to do with each of those. So it's just for information at this stage in a full report with the final um, uh, uh, tree protection report. We'll come back to you at a later date. Okay, proposed to note. Councillor Rainey and Councillor Thompson, thank you. The next piece of uh, correspondence, Paul, you can take that one. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, this is a, a letter from NAEA then. Um, you'll remember a letter that they had sent us back on the 31st of May then, just uh, saying that they were pausing consultation replies uh, in relation to uh, intensive agricultural applications um, that are matrimonia. Um, and this is just a letter now saying that that pause has been lifted um, and they're going to resume uh, offering advice based on the existing um, advice and protocol uh, and I suppose members slightly surprising um, uh, sort of wonder why they, they they paused in the first place if they were going to go back to their existing protocol um, and again uh, I suppose well it's a risk to ourselves members because um, in the consultation they said that the body of scientific evidence for the protocol the existing one has moved on significantly and they're doing a consultation on that now so um, interesting but Look, we'll, 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 we'll see what the comments, uh, consultation replies, um, uh, the content of that, uh, and we'll consider the matters then when we get them members. Thanks. Councillor McCrockery, John. Thank you. Uh, like to Don't propose. go into a diatribe, please. I'd like to propose the noting, and, and, and we didn't notice much difference between paused and the speed that they normally right, that's up. okay. Thank you. Uh, could somebody like to second those comments? Councillor Robinson, thank you very much. And the last piece of correspondence. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, and members, this is just a letter from the Housing Council um, to your Chief Executive. 
um, basically advising that the local development plans are an opportunity to put in place uh, planning policies for affordable and social housing. And they've noted there that uh, some of the councils have moved forward to their LDPs and they've quoted a policy from one of the other LDPs. So um, they're sort of requesting uh, that we, we take on board this, members. I, I think maybe we'll, we'll write back to them and tell them that we were the first council that adopted the LDP and we have made uh, policy provision for affordable housing in conjunction with NIHE and that plan strategy. Thanks, Chair. I think there's the uh, tendency, I think, of a uh, horse bolted door open, I think, uh, closed behind. Um, are we happy that uh, Paul writes back in those terms? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll take that as Councillor Robinson and Councillor McCluckery. Thanks. Um, we're on to 13. Any other? Oh, sorry. My apologies. How could I forget the main chair? Of the uh, council? Not at so, all. Not at all. I'm little. I'm easily overlooked. You are um, indeed. Don't... Chair, could I just ask uh, and uh, refresh my memory on uh, housing applications from uh, for estates or for whatever? How much percentage is there a ruling in there that we require a ten percent? Is it or something there? Attempt me the answer, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go. On. Just give me two seconds. Um, He's pulling the policy up to him. So the the policy is only engaged when there's a need. So whenever there's a an, a need for affordable housing, the policy is engaged then. Okay. So within um, within the policy, then the thresholds are uh, proposals for residential developments of ten houses or more, or on a site of a half a hectare or more then we'll require 10% affordable housing. And that was the thresholds were um, arrived at in conjunction with NIHE and they've been found to be sound. So, right. yeah. That Thanks, was Jeff. discussed the other night at the housing. Yep. Thank you. There, nobody's approached me about um, any other urgent and relevant business. And with that, I'm closing the meeting. Thank you very much for your perseverance and your interaction. Uh, safe home and I'll see you next month and we'll see you next week at the LDP as well virtually thank you